Asmat Guru Bionamaha, Asmat Panama Guru Bionamaha, Asmat Sarva Guru Bionamaha. So we're continuing on with our discussions of Mukshupadi uh, by Pila Lukacharya with a commentary by Manavala Ma The uh, We were up to uh, Sutra 84, and we're in the Tira Mantra Prakaranam. The Tira Mantra Prakaranam is about the Tira Mantra, Om Namo Narayanaya, otherwise known as the Astak Tira Mantra, because it has eight. Uh, syllables. And uh, the last thing that we were discussing is we were discussing the removal of obstacles. And the obstacles are three. In the 83rd uh, Sutra, it says that there are three obstacles, and those obstacles are Swarupa Virodhi. Virodhi means obstacles. Swarupa Virodhi, uh, an obstruction uh, of the, uh, the soul's essential nature. Uh, uh, upaya virodhi, obstruction of the means, the means to liberation. Excuse me. And uh, the prapya uh, virodhi, or the obstruction to the goal. So we're discussing those three obstructions. And uh, we're, we are discussing the relationship between those and the Mantra Shesha. Previously, we were discussing the Omkara. And the Omkara comes first in the Astakshara Mantra, and the second part of Astakshara Mantra is the Namo Narayanaya. The Namo Narayanaya is called the Mantra Shesha, the rest of the mantra. Okay, so, um, so uh, now we're going to discuss the next part about the removal of those obstacles and how the rest of the uh, Astakshara Mantra helps to remove those obstacles. So let's have a look at the commentary. So the question is, just what is the removal of these three obstacles? He reveals in this in sequence with the with the following three sentences. Um, text 85. The removal of the obstruction to the soul's true nature, right, which we described as Swarupa Virodhi, is affirming. I am yours. What is mine is yours. It's, uh, it's written here as, I am you, what is mine is you, right? And that's a quote, and that quote is coming from, that, that quote is, a, is another quote from Nalayaja Vipabandam. So we can have a look at that quote. It's uh, from Thiruvai Moli 299. So if we just have a look at uh, Thiruvai Moli 299. This is Tirai Moli 299, and the translation is hmm. Not knowing my true self, I thought I was my own. O radiant Lord, worshiped by the celestials, me, myself, me, and what is mine are yours. Okay. So going back to the, to the commentary. So that's being stated here by her as by the author here as I am you, I am you, and uh, what is mine is you. No, it means I am yours, and what is mine is yours. So that is the it's the footnote is 139. That's Tiruvai Moli 299. Okay, so that's uh, Namalwar saying that I thought that I thought that uh, I was mine, but I'm not actually mine, I don't belong to me. <laughs> I'm your property. And everything that everything I think belongs to me or is related to me, that's also your property. So everything is yours. Removal of the obstruction to the means, right, which was what we call upaya virodhi, right, the obstruction to the means, the means is upaya, right, is having the attitude, uh, remove my pain or don't remove it. 
I have no one else to relieve my distress. Right, and this is also a quote. This quote is coming also from Tiruvai Moli by Namolwa, 588. O great wonder lord reclining in Kudandai, armed with a sharp discus, whether you end my despair or not, you are my sole refuge. When my body uh, lang languishes and this life comes to an end, grant that I may hold onto your feet relentlessly. It's, this is also a quotation from uh, Tiruvai Moli 588. Um, where Namawa says, remove my pain or don't remove it. He's praying to the Lord. He's saying, you can either remove my pain or you, or you don't have to. I have no one else to relieve my distress. The only person I will go to is you. And you are, the, you are, you are my only hope for doing that. So you are my only means. My only means. Obviously, the removal of pain uh, refers to attaining liberation because it in liberation, we're full of bliss. And so remove my pain or don't remove it, right? I have no one else to relieve my bliss. Similarly, so that deals with the second, the second obstacle. And the third obstacle, the upaya virodi, and removal of the obstruction to the goal means saying, means saying, um, correct all my contrary desires. Correct all my contrary desires. So that's a quote from, that's a quote from Tirupawai by Andal and the 29th verse of Tirupawai. So let's have a look at the 29th. This is the 29th verse of Tirupawai by Andal out of 30 verses. It's the second last verse. Chicham Tirkali Manduna. And the English translation is Govinda, oh Govinda, in the wee hours of the morning, we have come to worship you and praise your golden lotus feet. Pray hear our purpose. You were born in the cowherd clan. Now you cannot refuse to accept our, our service to you. Know that your goods are not what we, come for, we came for, right? So we're not, in, we're not actually interested in, in liberation. <laughs> Through seven lives and forever, we would be close to you and serve you alone. And if your desires be different, you must, if our desires, if our desires are be different, you must change them. So this was the point, the point that was being uh, explained in the, in the commentary. Removal of the obstruction to the goal by saying correct all our contrary desires. If we have contrary desires, then the Lord can correct those, those desires. So uh, I am the obstruction, uh, the obstruction of the soul's true nature, right? Is saying, I am mine. So remember that that's the obstruction of the soul's true nature is the sword of Virodi, I am mine. Therefore removing it means saying, I am yours, and what is mine is also yours. Declaring that both self and possessions are the Lord's sheshas as, as his attributes. Sheshas again, shesha sheshi relationship between the, the shesha, the servant or the slave, right? Or the property, right? And the sheshi, the master. The obstruction to the means, right? Which is the upaya virodi is engaging oneself in self-protection, right? What do we say? We say that, that he is Gopritva uh, Rakshati uh, uh, is part of, part of the six aspects of surrender is Rakshati, that the Lord is going to protect us. So protecting yourself is a virodi, is a, an obstacle to accepting his protection. Right? Just like if you have a, do a drowning man, if you see a person and you think that he's in trouble, he's drowning, and you say, are you all right? He, he, if he thinks that he can save himself, he'll say, yeah, I'm all right. I'm okay. Uh, I, 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 don't need any, I don't need your help. Like that. So when, when the Lord sees us trying to protect ourselves, he thinks, oh, okay, 
He's trying to protect himself. Let him try to protect himself. There's no need for me to step in and protect him. So the way to get the Lord to protect you is to depend completely, totally, and have total faith in him protecting you and not to have any faith in your own protection that, that you can protect yourself. So the obstruction to the means is engaging oneself in self-protection. So engaging yourself in, in, the, in self-protection is an obstruction to accepting his uh, protection. Therefore, removing it means saying, remove my pain or don't remove my pain. I have no one else to relieve my distress. Just saying, I'm completely in your hands, O oh Lord. Right? If you want to save me, save me. If you don't want to save me, that's up to you. It's completely your satya sankalpa, your 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 understand your your a perfect will. It is your will to do so. Uh, we had a similar sentiment also. Uh, we just had a, a celebration of Gaur Purnima, uh, the appearance day of Sri Chaitanya. And Sri Chaitanya in his Shikshastika also said, if, even if you crush me by your embrace, oh Lord, you're my worshipable Lord, birth after birth. It's a similar attitude to this. Okay, so then therefore removing it means saying, remove my pain or don't remove my pain. I have no one else to relieve my distress. So this means declaring whether you get rid of my misery or not, I have nothing else. I have nothing or no one else or nothing else as a savior. The obstruction to the goal, which is the prapya of Virodhi, right? So we dealt with Swarupa Virodhi and we dealt with Upaya Virodhi, the obstructions to the uh, cause of the, the, the obstruction of the soul's true nature and the obstruction of the means. Now the, 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 the obstruction of the goal, the prapya virodhi, right? Is the notion of being self-purposed. Swa prayojana buddhi. Buddhi means intelligence or the, 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 the mentality, the mentality, swa prayojana. Swa prayojana that the goal is the self. Therefore removing it, uh, removing it means correct all my contrary desires. So even somebody has a contrary desire when they approach God, they want to get something from God. So they, they, they may want some even material goals. If they want the material goals, right, then it's considered to be an obstruction to the spiritual goals. Spiritual goal is what? To obtain, to attain moksha. And moksha means, again, the eternal ser divine service of the Lord in Sri Vaikuntha. It doesn't mean uh, impersonal liberation. Even impersonal liberation would be a different goal. It would be considered a swa, uh, a swa, a swa prayojana buddhi, right? A men the mentality of thinking up your own goal, having your own goal, right? right? Your own goal might be to be in Kaivalya, in, uh, in complete isolation and to enjoy the bliss of the soul. That is a type of liberation. But that is not the type of liberation that is uh, aspired for by the Sri Vaishnavas. Right? So he's saying, uh, correct, my, uh, correct uh, all our contrary desires. And he quotes from Andal's Tirupalai, uh, verse 29, uh, to give this point. That is, get rid of any desire we have except to please you. Any desire that we have except to perform eternal service to you in Vaikuntha is a wrong desire is what we call a propia virodi, is stopping us from having the right desire, is the obstacle of the goal, the obstacle of the goal. So whether the goal be, whether the goal that you have is to obtain some material, uh, material benefit or even going to the heavenly planets, right? Or kaivalya, which is means uh, the liberation of isolation, Right? These are contrary goals to the form of moksha that is aspired to by Sri Vaishnavas, that is the eternal service of the Lord and by Kunta. Okay, so as the obstruction, uh, as the obstruction to, the, to all three, the upaya, the, the swarupa, the upaya, and the prapya, right, is the soul's egoism and possessiveness, that is ahankara, which means I-ness, and mamakara, which means mine, I and mine, 
right? Min minus what belongs to me, what I think belongs to me. Therefore, he reveals how horrible they are and the benefit to be gained in removing them. Okay. So uh, before we continue on to the 86th uh, Sutra, let's have a look and see what Bibi and Angacharya says about this Sutra 85. So now we'll look at uh, Sutra 85, the commentary by Bibi and Angacharya. So here it is. So once again, the meaning of Sutra 85, the removal of the three ob obstacles or virodis, the Swarupa virodi, the Upaya virodi, and the Prapya virodi, right, are shown with examples. Uh, if, the, if examples are given of those for whom these three obstacles have to be removed, then the mode of their removal will be clear, right? So if we give an example from the, from the Nalaya Divyapanam, the 4,000 holy hymns of the Alwars, then, then it'll be clear how we have to act. So by reading the, the Alwars works, we can, we can understand very clearly how to remove these obstacles. So therefore, they're presented here. Number one dealing with Swarupa Virodi or the obstacle of the soul's um, Swarupa or soul's true nature, right? Uh, to be as I and, my, I and mine are yours will lead to the removal of Swarupa Virodi. As was told by Alwar, meaning Nam Alwar in uh, Thirubai Moli 299, um, he says, I lived, lived as I and mine is to live with the ahankara and mamakara, the inus and minus, which is the swarupa virodi, which is the obstacle to the real understanding that I, that I and everything that I think is mine all belong to you. So it also as told by Peri Alwar, the father of Andal, is to, is to set the I and mine as shesha to him, right? As serv servant to him or slave to him, um, with, which is the removal of the Swarupa Virodi. So that is, that's the way to get rid of the uh, impediment of not understanding the true nature of the soul is to think like, to think the actual true nature of the soul, which is to be a shesha, to be a servant or a slave or a possession of the Supreme Lord. Now, the second part here about uh, Upaya Virodi, the obstruction to the means, Right, uh, so the example is given, uh, and it is the removal of upaya virodi in the uh, in the protection of the jiva. If the jiva thinks that he too can protect himself, that interferes with the protection he gives or the Lord gives. This is the, uh, this is therefore upaya virodi. This is an obstacle in the means to liberation. If the jiva or the individual soul were to be like periyawar, right? Uh, and he gives a quotation here, and, and does not seek another person's house for his protection, then that describes the state of removal of the Upaya Virodi. So he qu quotes also here another, another verse by Peri Alwa. We can, we can look it up, but uh, we don't know exactly where it's from, so we're not going to look it up. And the third paragraph ex explains the third Virodi or the third obstacle, the third obstacle being the Prapya Virodi, the obstacle by, uh, by not understanding the proper goal, the proper goal being the Lord himself. The Lord is both the means and the goal. So the proper, Lord, the proper goal is the Lord himself, but not just the Lord, but also but the, his service, his eternal service, which not only means his eternal service, but his eternal service and all, all of his associates service, his consorts, his, his servants, his devotees uh, service, right? That is the Bhagavat uh, Seva, Bhagavat Kainkarya, the service of the Lord himself, and Bhagavata Kainkarya, the service of everybody associated with the Lord. So to be as that, that quote from uh, Tirupawai 29, in the is the removal of the Upaya Virodi. Being in his service uh, is the Upaya. The Upaya, um, again, Upaya means, means, Upaya means the goal. So we say Prapya. Prapya means to pay, same thing, the goal. The obstacle is, the obstacle to that is gaining joy for the self in that service. Just as the moon, breeze, flower, fragrance, etc., provide joy to others, 
but gain nothing for themselves, so too should be the jiva. So you can imagine the soul has so many qualities, has so many, so many, so many qualities, so many attributes like that. Just like the, the moon, breeze, flower, fragrance, these are all, these are all different qualities. And they all provide joy to others, right? But gain nothing for themselves. This is what is told in the Tirupavai Pasaram, uh, in, the 20, in the 29th verse of Tirupavai. And it says, the word of varu uh, also means the same thing. Therefore, the removal of self-intent in the service. So the we have to remove this idea of I want something in the service, out of the service, right? As, uh, and, and, that, uh, and that intent in his service, right? Uh, that, is, that will remove the, what we call the upaya or the propia virodi, the, the uh, obstacle to the goal. We have to remove that self-intent. So there are even, there are even many Vaishnavas, uh, Vaishnavas who have this idea that we can approach God for something. We can go and we can go to him and we can ask for something like that. But the real, the real idea, uh, the idea being put forward here in, uh, in, uh, in Mamukshapati about the Astakshara mantra is that it should just, the real meaning of Astakshara should remove that, should remove that, should remove that idea that we have some other, we go to God for some other means, but not, not some other means, some other goal, some other goal. Okay, so we'll go back to the original text. Uh, the original text, going back to the original text. Okay, so continuing on with, um, continuing on with uh, text 86. Maha, right? Maha is the destruction of the Swarupa. The Swarupa meaning the true essence of the soul, the true nature of the soul is destroyed by this Maha. Maha means my. Namaha is what uplifts Urjivana, the Swarupa. So Namaha, not that. The negation of Maha. Maha is the thing which previously it was it, it was mentioned that there are that we're talking about the word Namaha. In the, in the mantra shesha, the, part, the last part of uh, Astakshara mantra comes namo. And the word namo, if we, if we take the word namo out, it becomes namaha, right? It, it only becomes namo when Narayanaya comes after it because the end that starts Narayanaya uh, changes the namaha, the aha to o. So it becomes namo. But the word is namaha or namas. Some people say namas, so namaha. Okay, so namaha. Right means na maha. We already talked about it being broken up into two. Maha means myself, I and mine, ahankara and mamakara, I and mine. So what I'm thinking, I and mine, that's bad, right? That's a, that is what? What kind of virodi? What kind of obstacle is that? That is swarupa virodi. That is an obstacle to the true nature of the soul. When we negate that, when we say na maha, not that, right? I am not mine right? Or it is not mine. Everything else is not mine. I am not mine. Even, even I am not mine, right? That is the true understanding of the true nature of the soul, right? And that is negated by saying this word, namaha, or in the mantra, namo. So when the chaitana, or chaitana means the jivatman, the, the sentient being, has possessiveness towards himself and his own things, right? Ahankar and mamakar. Right? Then the two syllables, mama, indicate possessiveness. <clears throat> so there's a, there's a footnote here, and the footnote is, uh, footnote 142 says in the book, it, this is a quote from <clears throat> Arhi Buddha Samhita, which is a uh, text of the Pancharatra, Agama, uh, 50, chapter 52, verse, verse 25. Okay, so we can't look that up. We don't have that text readily available to us. We do have it, but we can, we can look it up somewhere else. Continuing on, this says that in this ma, right, the maha, right, or the ma meaning mine, um, there is both egoism 
and possessiveness. Again, egoism in Sanskrit, ahankara, inus, and possessiveness, mamakara, minus, inus and minus. Therefore, engaging in it, right, in this, in this mentality of, of, uh, of uh, ahankara and mamakara, or, or egoism and possessiveness, what we call inus and minus, right? Therefore, engaging in it destroys the soul's true nature destroys the soul's true nature. It's basically like spiritual suicide because without the true nature of the soul, without understanding the true nature of the soul, there can be no real surrender to God. There can be no uh, liberation. So engaging in this namaha, however, right, by using the term namaha in the mantra om namo narayanaya, the namo, however, is what uplifts the soul's essential nature. It brings it forth. The souls it it, it uh, exposes the soul's uh, essential nature. It is also said, and this is a quote from Mahabharata twelve thirteen four. Uh, there's a sloka that says, two letters spell death." Here we're talking about spiritual death. We're not talking necessarily about material death. Here, two two letters spell death. Um, three letters, the abode of Brahman. Two letters, the two letters are mama, mama. The word mama is the dative, is the, excuse me, the genitive case, the possessive case of the, 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 the word ma, ma meaning ma, ma meaning me, ma means me, mama means mine. So the two letters are mama, mean death. And three letters, mean the abode of Brahman. Three letters means we can go to Sri Vaikuntam. We can go to the abode of, of, the, of God. Right? Our three letters are spiritual. So two letters means death, means staying in this material world. And three letters means going to moksha, going to the eternal service of, of the Lord. The three letters are namama, namama, or in this case, namaha or namo in the Omnamonarayana mantra. So this is a... This is a quote from Mahabharata. Mahabharata is also a very great scripture, which gives us a lot of proof about different things. So as well as quoting, as well as, uh, as Pila Lokacharya, the, the, the author, quoting from the different Prabandhas, right? Also, Manavala Mahamuni in his commentary has quoted from Mahabharata as well. Very nice. So it is not enough to merely destroy the obstruction to Swarupa, Upaya, uh, uh, and Prapya. Right? So now he's explained how it destroys those three things. But then he says after that, it's just not, a, it's not enough just to destroy him. He says that this namas or namaha or namo, right? This word also causes these three to shine forth, right? So first of all, he explained how there are these obstacles and the obstacles are destroyed. So that's negative. That's a negative thing. We have, we have things blocking us from attaining liberation. Those things are, are, are roadblocks in the way. The word namaha not only gets rid of those, gets rid of those obstacles, but it also adds something positive. It positively gives us the proper understanding of the soul, the proper swarupa, the proper understanding of the means, right? The proper upaya, right? Meaning the Lord himself and the proper goal. And the goal of, again, is the Lord himself. The, the prapya or the upaya, right, is the proper goal himself, the Lord. So, or the Lord's service, let's say, in, 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 eternally in Vaikuntha. So these, these things are, are positively given. So there are three negative things, uh, which, are, which are the blocks which are gotten rid of. And also, positively, we understand not only we got rid of our bad concepts, but we've got the right concepts of, about these three, three, these three issues. Right, so let's see what uh, Bibi Anangacharya has to say about this particular sutra number um, 86. So again, this sutra 86, uh, associating with ahankara and mamakara, the egoism and possessiveness, or otherwise known as inus and minus, right, leads to the destruction of one's swarupa, the destruction of one's true identity, the soul's true identity. 
being without them leads to the restoration of the Swarupa or the soul's true identity. There are three virodis or obstacles shown before. It is ahankara I, mamakara mine, that are the source. These are the source of the three virodis, right? Of the three obstacles. Therefore, the danger of their presence and the goodness that comes about with their removal are shown. Within maha, right? The word ma, me, right? Both ahankara and mamakara are present because maha means my, me, but it also means mama, mine, me and mine, I and mine, right? Both ahankara, both egoism and possessiveness, mamakara, are present, minus and minus. The pride about oneself is ahankara. The pride about one's possessions is mamakara, right? So this is the difference between minus and minus. They both lead to the destruction of one's swarupa, one's uh, true understanding of the soul, of the true nature of the soul. Not being attached to these leads to the revival of the swarupa, the true nature of the soul, and therefore namaha, or the word namo in Omnimonrayanaya, is equivalent to swarupa ujjivana, the shining forth of the, the essence of the soul, the true nature of the soul. Okay, let's go back to the text. So, uh, continuing on with um, text 87, right? So that we're gonna hear a little bit more about this. This displays the soul's true nature, Swarupa, right? The true means, the Upaya, right? And the goal, Pala, the fruit, the fruit of, of, of uh, the endeavor, right? So the true nature of the soul is to be the shesha or the servant of property or slave of the, of the Lord. The true nature of the means is, is the Lord himself is the means to our liberation. And the goal is service to the Lord in Tree Lake Quinta eternally. So the Lord is also the, the goal and the means. So he explains this in the following three sentences. So the, uh, the in, Text 88, he says, Worshipping the Lord of Tolai Vili Mangalam. Tolai Vili Mangalam, which is a, one of the Divideshas which is spoken of by uh, Namalwar in his Tiruvai Moli. Uh, and specifically in Tiruvai Moli, he's quoting here Tiruvai Moli 651 states the, the soul's true nature. Okay, so let's just deal with that first. So I'm gonna read the translation of Tiro Amoli um, 651. This begins a decade where friends of, of the heroine, traditionally understood to represent Namawar himself, are addressing the mother, telling her that her daughter has been lost uh, to the Lord of uh, Tolai Vili Mangala. Okay, so what Nam Alwar is is, in, is, uh, is 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 writing his poetry here to the Lord. He's praying to the Lord of of Tolai Vili Mangalam, right? And he's praying to the Lord in the uh, in in the bhava or in the in the in the in the attitude of a heroine, in, in, which is called in Sanskrit uh, Naiki Bhava or 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 Naika. It can be Naika Bhava or it can be Naiki Bhava. In that he is he's thinking of himself as a female lover of the Lord, a, a girlfriend of the Lord, a uh, consort of the Lord, and he is uh, he is he is praying to the Lord like that. So what does he say? So here, so the friends, the, he's the, the particular uh, pastoram that we're talking about, the particular verse in Naladivya Prabandha, uh Tirai Moli six five one, right? Is being it, it, it's a, it's as if it's being spoken by the friends of a person who is in love with the Lord of Tiru uh, Tol, uh, Tolai Mangala. Okay, so the friends are saying to the mother of the damsel who is in love with the Lord. The friends are saying, "Oh mother, there's no hope for your daughter, for she is worshiping the Lord of Tolai Vili Mangala, that city of tall buildings studded with flawless gems." 
tears are flowing from your daughter's water lily eyes, and she is torn with grief, sighing. O oh, one who bears the white conch and discus, O oh, one with wide lotus eyes. Okay, so this is the quotation uh, describing the the souls. Uh, the soul, the soul Swarupa. This is some. This is somehow this, the idea of this is uh, describing the soul's true nature. What is the soul's true nature? The soul's true nature is like this, like this damsel, who uh, is worshiping the Lord of Tolavili Mangalam. So, is an other. It's none other than a Namalwar conceiving himself as a damsel, who is worshiping the Lord of this place. So, homage to Nama, homage to Namaha. When we say namaha or namaste or namaskaram, right? We're using nama, right? We're, 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 we're saying homage to you, not to us, right? Homage to nama, the one who resides on Venkata. Venkata means uh, Tirupati, the hill of Tirupati, the Tirumala, the, uh, the mountain of, of Tirumala, meaning Lord Venkateshwara. And this is this quotation is from Tiruvai Moli 336. Uh, and that and this quotation helps us to understand the upaya or the means. Again, what is the means? The, the Lord is the only means. So if I read Tiruvai Moli 336, Namawa says, those who bear it as their duty to pay homage, literally saying Namaha, those who think that they that their duty is to literally say Namaha, or to offer obeisances to the Lord, to the one who resides on Venkata Hill, will have their sins burned and their bodily karma destroyed. Thus, they are doing only good things for themselves. So here it's explained how we can, uh, how we, how we, how we uh, uh, relate to the Lord, right, by, by, uh, doing namaskaram to the Lord. Even in the Bhagavad Gita, what Krishna says, uh, man mana baba man bhakto, right? Uh, always think of me. Majiji mam namaskuru, nama, namaskuru means offer your obeisances to me. Mami vaishasi satyam te, pati jane piyosuma, you will come to me. So, um, this is the, this explains the upaya, the means, the means. I receive the ultimate worshiping word, states the goal or the prapya, right? Or also known as upaya. So that is a that uh, is a reference to to uh, to ten eight seven, and here's the translation of Tiruvaimali ten eight seven seven. Uh, after such enjoyment, what can heaven offer? Exalting in the loftiest service. I received the ultimate worshiping word. The commentaries take this to be namas. So in the commentary to Tiruvai Moli 1087, which will come in uh, Bhagavad Vishen, uh, the Acharyas are explaining that uh, when the Alwar says, I received the ultimate worshiping word, the ultimate worshiping word is namaha or namo, offering obeisances to the Lord. This is the this word is used very often when we do even when we do ritual worship we use the word namaha a lot, all the time. Kesavaya namaha, Narayana namaha, Madhavaya namaha. When we're doing archana, when we sit, when we when we're simply sitting and meditating, also if we're if we're doing astakshara japa, uh, om, we're using this word nam, namo namaha. In in other mantras also in other vyapaka mantras like the twelve syllable mantra om namo bhagavate vasudevaya namo is there. In Om Namo Vishnave, the six syllable mantra, these are the three Vapaka mantras with, along with Astakshara mantra. So always this Namaha uh, uh, word is there. So uh, then he says here, so having explained that, explained about the three, the three, uh, the three proper states, first of all, he explained them in terms of being uh, in the previous two sutras, he has explained them in, in terms of being uh, roadblocks, the, what were the Virodis, the obstacles, right, to the, the Swarupa Virodi, the Upaya Virodi, and the Prapya Virodi. And now here we're talking about the true Swarupa, 
right? The proper swarupa, the proper upaya, and the proper goal. The proper means, the proper goal, and the proper, uh, the proper you know, nature of the soul. So Namawa describes the nature of a shesh or a servant or, or a slave. Uh, when he went to, uh, when he went so far as to seek out the holy places beloved by the Lord. So in Tiruvai Moli, uh, in Tiruvai Moli, Lord uh, uh, Namalwar, who is sitting in uh, Tirukurunguri, right, uh, which is a, the place uh, Alwar Chirunagari is called, and, uh, right, is a place where Namalwar is sitting and meditating, and he's underneath a, a tamarind tree. So in his mind, he's going to all these different holy places all over, all over India, and he's worshipping the Lord within those places, and he's meditating upon the service of the Lord in those places. So he's seeking out the holy places beloved to the Lord, right? As he revealed in the hymn saying, worshipping the Lord of Tolai Vili Mangalam. Here the word worshipping indicate, indicates saying Nama, right? So when we, when we see in the in the Tiruvai Moli, uh, in the Tiruvai Moli, um, Tiruvai Moli 651, that he uses the word worshipping. We should understand that word worshipping indicates, indicates the word Namaha, or Namo in the Astakshara Mantra, and in, in, in the worship of the Lord in general. So here, the word worshipping indicates indicates saying nama. Therefore, it states the soul's true nature. Now, homage or namaha or obeisance to the one who resides in Venkata, that, that quote, which is coming from Tiruvai Moli 336, states, states that uh, I am a shesha, I am a servant of the one who owns Tiruvenkata. Tiruvenkata means the, the, the hill of uh, Tiruvenkata. Uh, I do not belong to myself. By this, declaring his essent, uh, essential dependence or Swarupa Paratantram, right? Remember, Swatantra means independence, only the Lord is independent. Paratantra, everybody else apart from the Lord is dependent upon the Lord. So paratantrium means dependence on the Lord. Swarupa paratantra means our, our essence is to be dependent upon the Lord, our essential dependence on the Lord. The most important attribute of the soul is dependence on the Lord, right? As his property, as his servant, as his slave, right? On the Lord, without the right to save oneself. You don't have the right to save yourself. If you have, if you don't depend, if you're depending completely on someone else, right, then you can't depend upon yourself. You can't save yourself. And that's that's the attitude of the prapana. The prapana has to have this attitude that he cannot save himself. He establishes that the Lord alone is the upaya. So through this, uh, Tiruvai Moli 336. He has established this, this point that you cannot save yourself. You're completely dependent upon the Lord. Thus, he has stated the proper means, the means. Uh, I received the ultimate worshipping word. So in Tiruvai Moli 10.8.7, that quote, right? The worshipping word is said to be Namaha or Namo, or Namas. Uh, refers to how as delight in serving wells up in the soul, right? As the soul is serving the Lord, he gets blissful by serving the Lord. Ultimately, one has to say the worshiping word. The worshiping word, that word is namas or namo. Therefore, this states the goal. So all these things have been explained. Subservience to those who belong to the Lord, tadiya sheshatva. Tadiya sheshatva is another, another way of saying Bhagavata Sheshatva. Bhagavata Sheshatva. Bhagavata means the devotees of the Lord. Tadiya just means, Tad means him. Tadiya means of him. So Tadiya means anything of him. So everything belongs to the Lord. Everything is controlled by the Lord. Everything is supported by the Lord. Everything is, 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 is for his service, is meant for his service. So everything 
is in relationship to him and therefore everything is tariya. So that those things which specifically are in, in, in relationship to him are specifically serving him, like his consorts, his attendants, the acharyas, the alwars, the, the great devotees, the Vaishnavas, what are called, called Bhagavatas. Bhagavat, Bhagavat means God and Bhagavatas means those godly people, right? Those people are called Tadiya, right? Of the Lord. They belong to him. They're of him. Sheshatva. Sheshatva means service to them. The service to them. Subservience to those who belong to the Lord or Tadiya Sheshatva, which we can also call as Bhagavata Sheshatva, is also to be remembered. Anusandeya. Anusandeya means to remember, to remember deeply, fully, strongly, with the, to understand the meaning and remember it, is the meaning of this word. Therefore, Pilila Vichara states this. So, this. so he's going to give us, the next sutra is going to explain also that not only does, does this word namo mean that subservience to the Lord, right? But it also means it also means subservience to uh, everything related to the Lord, to all sentient beings, to, to the Lord's consorts, his attendants, his servants, the alwars, the acharyas, and the other Vaishnavas. So uh, before we go to uh, text 89, let's have a look at. Yes, everybody. All sentient beings, we can consider all sentient beings to be Bhagavatas. We can set, consider, every, Krishna says in read, everyone follows my path in all respects. So everybody's actually serving God, either directly or indirectly. Uh, but specifically those who are serving him directly, we consider to be the Vaishnavas. It's not that we should think uh, if there's some atheistic person out there that we should think, oh, we should serve that person because that person is also serving God, but he's serving indirectly. He's serving the material nature. You know, he's serving God's um, separated material energy. No, um, we, we, should, we can understand within our heart and we can honor everybody, all sentient beings, as being, as being related to the Lord, as being part of the Lord, part and parcel of the Lord, but, but, not, uh, the, but specifically those who are directly serving the Lord, we term as Bhagavatas. So let's have a look and see what... Uh, 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 Bibi Anangacharya says about this, uh, I think, uh, 88th Sutra. So, again, the meaning of the 87th Sutra was the Namas shows the Swarupa, the Upaya, and the Pala. The Swarupa meaning the essential nature of the soul, the Upaya meaning the means, and the Pala meaning the fruit or the goal. Uh, so, no stopping. Uh, not stopping at removing the obstacles, the Namaha also shows the self, the self nature, the Swarupa, the means, the Upaya, and the end, the Pala. Uh, the meaning of the 88th Sutra again, the pass, the different Pasarams, right? The first, uh, the word uh, Tolam in, uh, in the first, uh, the first Pasaram, which is uh, Turamoli 651, is synonymous with the word Namaha or Namas. Therefore, Namas shows that the Swarupa, that the Swarupa, uh, shows the Swarupa. The, in, the, in the next uh, one, in the next Pasaram, uh, Tiro Moli 336, right? Uh, the, word, the word Namaha shows the Upaya, or the means. And in the last uh, quotation, uh, Tiro Moli 1087, right? The kind karyam or the service uh, in Prapti uh, is, is shown through the word Tolam. Tolam meaning uh, Namaha, worship. Therefore, Namaha also shows the fruit or the goal. So P.B. Nangachar is saying, as said before, Namas or the word Namo, not, not only removes the obstacles to Swarupa, Upaya, and Purusharta, here is using the word Purusharta to mean goal, right? So the, the nature of the soul, the nature of the means, and the nature of the goal. But it also expresses the same. So, uh, so the first one shows the, the nature of the jiva, first quotation, uh, which is enslaved to him, such as it will go to those places that he likes. Right? The, uh, here, is, here the word tolam, which means worship, is equivalent to namaha, right? 
And therefore, Namaha describes the swarupa or the essential nature of the jiva, the soul. In the second quotation, the second quotation shows the removal of swarakshana, swarakshana. So swarakshana means self-protection. We have to remove this idea of self-protection because that's an obstacle to the understanding of the means, the upaya. The real, the real means is the Lord. So the real means is not ourselves. We don't, it's, it's, we don't look to ourselves to, to be the means of our liberation in any way, what shape or form, right? So we're not trying to protect ourselves or do anything to advance ourselves towards the goal of moksha, right? But he is the means. He himself is the means. And Namaha here expresses the Upaya, which is him, the Supreme Lord. So in the third quotation, which is Tiruvam only 10, 8, 7, the Alwar, meaning Nam Alwar, shows that when the Kainkarya Prapti occurs, when we attain the service of the Lord, which is moksha, right? Uh, when Kankarya Prapti uh, occurs, its higher form is described by Namas, by the word Namo. Therefore, Tolam, uh, Tolam Sol stands for, the, this word Tolam, again, worshipping, stands for Namaha, and therefore shows the fruit or the goal of the, the, whole, uh, the, whole point, the whole point of life, the whole goal of life. Right. So having a look at, uh, let's get back to the original text. 89. So now, now that we've discussed that, now the next point is he's also going to bring in the point about Bhagavata Sheshatva, or Tariya Sheshatva, it's called here, right? Which means serving not only the Lord, but the Lord's associates and the Lord's consorts and the Lord's, that those who are associated with the Lord. So text 89 is about that. Here, um, Subservience to the Lord's devotees, or Bhagavate Sheshatva. Remember up here we used, he said, he called it Tadiya Sheshatva. It's the same thing. Bhagavate Sheshatva is to be remembered. As in the hymn, if I mingle with anyone, it would be as the slave of your devotees. And that comes, that, that is a, that is a uh, quote from Peritirmoli 8.10.3. So Paratirmoli 8.10.3 says, uh, I will not keep company of those who say there are other gods. If I mingle with anyone, it would be as a slave of your devotees. Rather than speak of all else, I have learned your holy eight letters, O Lord of Kanapura. Okay, so this is a translation to Paratirmoli 8.10.3. The Alwar says, I have learned your holy eight letters. Your holy eight letters is a ref reference to the Astakshara Mantra or Namo Narayanaya. Thus becoming the slave of your devotees. Right? So we can understand here that because the Alwar has said that, that means that, that the mantra itself, the Alwar is saying the mantra itself also indicates service to the devotees. So Om Namo Narayanaya doesn't just uh, represent service to the Lord, but that service to the Lord also includes service to those who are associated with the Lord, Bhagavata Sheshatva or Tariya Sheshatva, service to that which is related to the Lord, the Bhagavatas, the devotees. This means I have learned this from the Tira Mantra, service to your devotees. Thus, according to this hymn, in the word namas, or namo, right, which gets rid of egoism and possessiveness and causes subservience to the Lord to shine forth as it truly is, we must also reflect on the subservience to the Lord's devotees, which is, which is its grand culmination. Tat, tat kashta, tat kashta. There are those who say that the subservience to the Lord's devotees, as recalled in the meaning here, is found elsewhere, not only in this namas. Therefore, he says, right? So now, now what Pila Pacharya is going to say is, okay, so the subservience to the devotees, the Bhagavata Sheshatva, is also shown in, in the word namo in Omramon Narayanaya. 
But there are some who also say that it's, uh, it's, it's, it's shown in other places in the Astatra Mantra, and that will come to in a minute. So before we do that, let's look and see um, how an, a PB and Angacharya deals with the 89th Sutra. So the 89th Sutra, again, according to PB and Angacharya, is as said by Tirumangai Alwar, this Pere Tirumoli is written by uh, Tirumangai Alwar. Tirumangai Alwar was chronologically the last of the Alwars. He says, this Namaha, or this word Namo, not only removes the obstacles, but also contains the height of Bhagavata Sheshatvam. Bhagavata Sheshatvam. So, excuse me, the height of Bhagavata Sheshatvam, the height of service to God, right? Which is Bhagavata Sheshatvam, service to his devotees. So, through the meaning of the, uh, through the, meaning of the Namas, or, or Namo, one should also practice Bhagavata Sheshatvam, or the service of the devotees. Therefore, it's explained here, through this namas or namo, this word namo, which removes the ahankara and mamakara, right? The iness and the egoness and possessiveness, the iness and minus, right? Completely and brings about the service of God, the Bhagavata Sheshatva. One should also follow the Bhagavata Sheshatva or the service of the devotees, which is the height of Bhagavata Sheshatva or the service to God. The highest form of the service to God is the service of his devotees. So Chiramangal was Pasram from Periyatidamoli, right, is the measure that shows that. Right. So so this is this is where we quote the Alwas to show that uh, that is also mentioned there in, in the Astakshara Mantra by the word demo. And now we go back to the, the original text and we'll see that th some people say that this is uh, that this idea of Bhagavata Sheshatva, this idea of serving the devotees, is also found in other places in the Astakshara Mantra. So some say this is in the letter A. Remember we had the letter A in, in the Omkar, the first letter of the, of the Omkar. Some say it is in the letter U, the second letter of the Omkar, right? So Akara, Ukara, Makara, Iti, A, U, M is Om, and the, or the Pranava, which is the first part of the Astakshara Mantra. We already discussed it. And some, some people say that this Bhagavad Sheshatra is also understood in the letter A, and the Bhagavad Sheshatra, the service to the devotees, is also understood in the letter U. Some people say that since the soul subservience to the Lord is stated in the, in the fourth case ending on the letter A, right? Subservience to the Lord's devotees, Bhagavad Sheshatra, which is a combination of subservience to the Lord, Bhagavad Sheshatra, is in the letter A. So again, if we remember back when we were discussing the Omkar or the Pranava, it's made up of three letters, A, U, and M. The first letter, A, indicates the Supreme Lord, Sri Manarayana. We also understood that it also can, can include Mahalakshmi. It can also include here, it's understood, it can also include all the other, all the other uh, things which are associated, all the, all the other um, Bhagavatas, all the devotees of the Lord, all the things which are, which are meant for the service of the Lord, right? And therefore, uh, we understood, if we remember back, we understood the letter A. If we break up the, 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 if we break up the letters of the Omkar, we understood that the letter Haya has this inherent Aya, just like the word Narayanaya has this ending Aya. This ending Aya is the fourth case ending, which means a dative case, which means two or four. So two or four A, two or four Narayana, right? Right? Aya, I and Aya. Right, means two or four A. A means Narayana, the Supreme Lord. So Narayanaya also means the same thing. And two or four Narayana. Two or four Narayana also includes Nara. Narayana also includes Nara. And Nara means human beings, or means the devotees of the Lord. So here it's also stated, right, that this uh, that we discussed before that just like we can understand that. That, that letter A in the Omkara has the, has the ending Aya on it, and therefore it means service to the Lord, two or, four, two or four the Lord. It also means service to Mahalakshmi. It also means service to the devotees. That's the point, right? Now, some say that subservience to no other, right? Anya, Anya Arta Sheshatva, Anya Arta Sheshatva, right? Ananya Arta Sheshatva. 
right? Service to no other but the Lord, right? Culminates in subservience to those who belong to him, Tadiya Sheshatra. And therefore, it is in the letter U, right? Right? Remember what the letter U in Omkara meant? The letter U stood for exclusiveness. Exclusiveness. So, so what he's talking about here is anyart, uh, uh, ananyarta sveshatva means exclusive service to the Lord. Right? So that is explained by the letter U in the Omkar. So therefore, it is the letter U which states that the soul belongs to no other. The soul serves no other. Is meant for the service of no other but the supreme Lord, right? Since it is the since uh, it is implied in the meaning, it is appropriate that it is stated here where the defects of ahankara and mamakara, egoism, possessiveness, or inus and minus, are removed. Even if it is also stated in those places, so it's appropriate for Pinalokacharya and Manavala Mahamuni to say to explain here. To explain it all here, right? Because they're talking about the mantra shesha. They're talking about Namo Narayanaya and specifically starting with the word Namo or Namaha or Namas. They're, they're explaining that word and therefore they're explaining in detail that that also means Bhagavata Sheshadva or the service of the devotees, right? So what they want to do is they just want to look back and say, therefore, it's possible also to understand from the letter A and the letter U in Omkara that also we can understand the letter A and the letter U to also have these meanings of Bhagavata Sheshatva or service to the devotees, right? He, real, he reveals the difference between one's attitude before understanding the tamas and the attitude that arises afterwards. So in the next uh, sutra, we're going to hear about the difference between the understanding of a, that, that a person has, right? Uh, he reveals the difference in one's attitude before understanding these things and the difference that arises afterwards. Okay. So before we go there, let's, uh, let's see what Pibi Nangatraya has to say about um, Sutra number 90. Sutra number 90, again, the, the translation is, some say that the Bhagavata Sheshatvam or the service to the devotees, right, described, described previously, is present in the suppressed fourth case. Remember that the fourth case ending is Aya, and it's suppressed because A, U, and M, if we consider them to be a compound, the first two letters will not have, will not have any endings. Only the last letter will have an ending in, in Sanskrit compound. So if we split them up into three letters, the Omkar, then A will not, A is said to have a suppressed or inherent Aya. Right, so here he's saying uh, is present in the suppressed fourth case of the of akara of the letter a. Some say it is in the ukara, right, which removes anya sheshatva, anya sheshatva, or there it was said ananya sheshatva. Anya sheshatva means service to another. Ananya means also service to another. Ananya sheshatva, right? So it means service to service to another. And why? Because we already said previously that the letter U means exclusivity. So exclusivity means service to him only and not to anybody else. So we can say service to him, but service not to anybody else. So now what they're saying is that that him, that when we say service only to him, it also in, includes Mahalakshmi and it also includes the devotees. It also includes all the, the Vaishnavas, all the devotees of the Lord, like that. So it also includes Bhagavata Sheshatva. So, someone, uh, so some say that the Bhagavata Sheshatvam, or the service to the Vaishnavas, the service to the devotees, which is present in the practice of Nama, right? Practice of Namaha, when not me, but to others, right? Who are the servants of the Lord, right? Is to be found in the letter A and the letter U, as explained here. The first part of the Pranava is the letter A, which contains a suppressed fourth case. A is understood to be Aya. Right, just and it means the same as Narayanaya. Therefore, it, uh, I'm sorry, through it, the jiva's Bhagavat Sheshatva is shown. So the jiva or the individual soul's servant, the servitorship to God is shown. 
by the letter A, right? Because the letter A means Aya, right? Because Bhagavat Sheshatvam is the Bhagavata Sheshatvam or the service to the devotees is the height of Bhagavat Sheshatvam, is the height of service to God. Some say that the practice of Bhagavata Sheshatvam or the service to the devotees can also be found in that letter A itself. That's the first point. The second point is some also say that it can be found in the letter U. The letter U that comes after the letter A in the pranava, removes ananya sheshatva or anya sheshatva. It removes service, the, the obligation to serve others. It removes the service to, to the obligation to serve others. It says exclusivity, only service, only, only serve the Lord. The height of removal of anya sheshatva is having bhagavat sheshatva, bhagavata sheshatva. The height of removal of service to others means service to the devotees. And therefore, some say that service to God, and therefore some, some say that service to the devotees, Bhagavad Sheshatram, can be found in the Ukara itself, in the letter U. So these are just different ways of understanding these letters, of understanding. The point is that when we chant the Astakshara Mantra, when we meditate upon the Astakshara Mantra, we have to meditate upon all these meanings. These are the inner meanings of the different letters of Pranava and of the Mantra Shesha, of the, of the Astakshara Mantra. So the, the idea is to keep all of these meanings in our mind to understand the true meaning of the, of the mantra. This Bhagavad, Bhagavad Sheshatvam, or the service to the bodies, is not obtained by words. That is, it is not stated explicitly. Right? It's not stated explicitly. That's why... Previously, when we discussed in detail the Omkara, right, we didn't explicitly say this, right? But it is seen through the meaning. It's seen through the meaning because later on we discussed the word Namo and we understood the meaning of the word Namo to mean also to include, right, the service to the devotees. And therefore, we can look back now and see we can look back and, and see that when we were discussing the letter A and the letter U in Omkara, that that also could be understood to be part of them, their meaning. Therefore, it can be found elsewhere. Uh, so, therefore, therefore, it can be found anywhere. Nevertheless, it is Sri Pila Lokacharya's divine thought that it is best to find it in Namas, uh, which removes the Ahankara and the Mamaka, right? So, Pila Lokacharya, he's of the opinion that the best way to explain the Bhagavata Sheshatva or where the Bhagavata, where the service to the Lord's devotees comes is from the, letter, from the word Namo, from the word Namaha. That's the best place to, des to describe it. So if you're teaching people the meaning of the Astakshara Mantra, then you first of all teach them that this Nama is the, is the, is the important word which, which has these, destroys these three um, obstacles and and gives shines forth these three aspects right of the swarupa the upaya and the and the prapya or the uh eternal nature of the soul the means and the goal right so and and that that also includes right the the, the upaya or the means is also the service of uh also the service of the devotees also the service of the devotees right so so therefore, that's the best way to do it. But in case you want to go into a little bit more detail with somebody, you can say, yeah, it also comes from the letter A and the letter U in Omkara. So if we were, if we, let's say if we were just to speak to people about Omkara, we could explain also the letter A and the letter U in this way to, ex, to mean the service of the devotees also. So let's look at uh, Sutra 91 in the text. So here, uh, now we're going to be discussing about the difference between one's attitude before understanding, right, the word Namaha, and the attitude after understanding the full meaning of the word Namaha. We've just described the word Namaha. We've just understood all the different meanings of the word Namaha, how it includes the Swarupa, the Upaya, and the Prapya Virodis, and how it, it, uh, it, it, it makes the proper understanding of Swarupa, Upaya, and Prapya or or pala, uh, the fruit, the, the goal, uh, to it gives the proper understanding of those things, right? 
So we've just explained all that. So now the question is, before understanding all those explanations, we think of one thing. And after, what kind of attitude do we have after understanding that? So in text 91, he says, the Lord, Ishwara, is for himself alone. Insentient matter, right? Which means the, the material universe, right? Made of prakriti, or what we call hankara. These are the eight, uh, uh, Krishna says, uh, uh, prakriti rastada. this prakriti, this material nature is my separated uh, energies. And he delineates them in basically eight forms, earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence, ego. Right, and we can divide them up into, into other, uh, we can talk about some other, we can talk about the other tattvas too. We were talking about when we talked about the soul being the 25th tattva, uh, represented by the 25th um, consonant of the Sanskrit alphabet. There, these other consonants represented the uh, Kamindriyas, Gyanindriyas, the knowledge acquiring senses, the uh, organs of, um, uh, of, uh, of, uh, 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 of work, the working senses, the working senses and the knowledge acquiring senses, the Kamindriyas and Gyanindriyas, uh, and also different, uh, different uh, things, the mind, um, and, and finally, the soul is the 25th one. Okay, so anyway, so in sentient matter, or achit, right? Achit, chit means consciousness. So unconscious things, you know, like matter, right? Is only for others. Is only for the purpose of others. It's not, right? The Lord is for himself. Is, is, he's, for, he's for his own purpose. He, he, he himself is for his own purpose. In sentient matter is, is for the purpose of others, right? The soul of the Atman, which is also called chit, as as or consciousness, right? Knowledge. Um, the soul is for himself and for others both. It's for himself and for others both, right? The soul has some minus. He has some aspect of minus and, and minus, but it's also for others, right? That is the idea that the soul held has held previously, right? So the idea that we come into this with. The, the natural idea of the soul who's bound here in this material world is he thinks that God is for his own purpose, that insentient matter is to be used by everybody, by others, by sentient beings, either by God or by us, right? And that, the soul, the, that, uh, that you think that I am, that I and mine, right? That, that, uh, that my soul and my uh, and, and other things, uh, either sentient or insentient, my family, my nation, whatever, my community, right, plus uh, all my possessions, which may be um, made of achit or, or insentient uh, objects, material objects, these are also, these are for, my, for myself and for, and for others also, right, the soul is for himself and for others also, I'm also can be serve, serving for others and I can be for the purpose of others, but I can also be for my own purpose. That is the previous idea held. That is the purpose. That is what he thinks before he understands these, this, uh, the word Nama, the, all the implications of the word Namaha that we just went through. Right. But contrary to this, Nama says, right, once he understands Nama, the word Nama, right, says, I request you, right, to take me for your own sake, like in sentient matter. Right. So what, what, we're, what we're requesting the Lord is see us just like a possession. Just like, just, like a, just like an insentient object that you own. We are your property. Right? It's, it's interesting. You, uh, to do property, you have to think like property. <laughs> it's a, a little uh, thing in English that I thought of. So yeah, the idea is that we become, we understand, we understand ourselves to be like the property of the Lord, the property of the Lord in the sense that we are for his service only, and therefore he can do with us what he likes. So it is said that self-autonomy, so we'll just say that again, but contrary to this, the word namaha, right? In Om Namo Narayanaya, the word namo, right? The explanations that we just gave of, Om, of namo, right? is really a request for the Lord to take us as his property, like in sentient matter, 
So just in the same way that he owns and controls the material universe, he can own and control, he owns and controls us like that, just like that. And we have no, you know, we should have no will to, to think that we are for ourselves or we are for any other purposes. So it is said that self-autonomy, Swatantra, is the essential nature of the Lord. And that is described <clears throat> by, uh, in, uh, by Parasurabhata in Sri Gunaratnakosha 28, right? Uh, Hmm. It says Swarupam Swatantram Bhagavata. Okay. So um, thus, so it is, a, it is that self autonomy or Swatantra that's the essential nature of the Lord. Remember, the Lord is the only Swatantra. He's the only one whose essential nature is completely independent. The, uh, thus, the Lord, whose essential nature is autonomy or self sufficiency, is uh, is one who exists only for his own purposes. The essential nature of insentient matter or achit is dependence. Achit is dependence. It's, is, its essential nature is dependence. Material nature is completely dependent on the Lord, Paratantra. Uh, for without any consciousness or intelligence, right? Chaitanya Rahita. Rahita means without. In Sanskrit. So Chaitanya, the word Chaitanya means consciousness. So without consciousness or intelligence, right? That's why we call it achit, without consciousness, right? Uh, it lacks the capacity to think for itself. That's the whole idea. So the whole idea is that the prapana, the person who is surrendered to the Lord, he has to think that, that I am lacking any capacity to think for myself, to do, I, I'm simply meant to follow the will of the Lord. Therefore, it exists only for the sake of others, this, this, uh, this material energy, only, only for the sake of others. The soul has subservience, sheshatra, uh, as stated in the fourth case ending, as well as the capacity for uh, nyatritva. Nyatritva means uh, knowledge, for knowledge, for knower. The soul, the soul is a knower. The soul is a knower, but the soul is also a slave, is also a servant, is also a possession of the Lord, as stated by the letter M, right? In the Omkara, the last letter, M. Thus, uh, it both exists for its own sake by the force of its capacity to know and exists for the sake of another on the account of its subservience, right? It exists for its own sake because it has this capacity to know. It has its capacity for consciousness. What were we saying up here before? Why dull matter? Why matter doesn't have, why matter is completely dependent. Matter is completely dependent upon a sentient person, a sentient being, right? It just sits there. It takes the soul or God to do something with matter. So matter is completely dependent upon a sentient being to do something with it. Right, therefore it exists for the sake of the others, of the sentience, right? There, there are different sentience. There's the Lord, he's a sentient, and, and the jivas, the, 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 uh, the individual souls, they're also sentient. So they're all sentience. So matter, we understand, in the beginning, we understand that matter is, can be manipulated by us, can be manipulated by the Lord. So therefore, um, uh, thus, uh, the idea, right, thus, it both exists for, uh, but when, when, when we think of the, the self, the self has two things. The self has this, this capacity for knowledge or intelligence or, or consciousness, but it also has this subservience. And we discussed it before that the, the, the idea of subservience, right, is a, is a far greater attribute of the soul than the, than the fact that the soul has consciousness or, or attributive knowledge, right? Thus, it both exists for its own sake by the force of its capacity to know, right? So we can say it exists for its own sake because it has this capacity to know and to think, right? I think therefore I am, right? 
and it exists for the sake of another on the account of its uh, subservience. And that other can be the Lord and also Mahalakshmi and also the, the, the Lord's devotees. But contrary to the idea which has arisen in the word prior to namas, right? Contrary to the idea which has arisen in the word prior to namas, which means the omkara, this namas or this word namaha makes the request, right? So what he's saying here, Manavala Mahamuni is saying here, when we first understood, when we first understood the omkara, right? We didn't understand this particular aspect. This particular aspect comes to us in the word nama or namo. It makes the request to be taken and used for his delight, just like insentient matter, which exists only for the sake of others. Right? So this is really our prayer when we when we say the word namo. This is like Namalwar's hymn saying, take me for your sake alone. Right? And this hymn is Tiruvai Moli 294. So I'm just going to uh, stop the recording here for a second. So in Tiruvai Moli 294, Namalwar says the following. My Lord resides in my heart forever saying, serve me alone at all times. He has taken me as his own. This is indeed a blessing for us. So we don't see this as, as a bad thing that the Lord treats us as his property. We are his property. We are his servants. We are his slaves. And therefore, if he, if he, if he treats us like that, that is natural. That is proper. Uh, so. My Lord resides in my heart forever, saying, serve me alone at all times. He has taken me as his own, his own property. This is indeed a blessing for us. So going back to the, to the text, right? Now he explains, he's going to explain the statement for, for your sake. For your sake, for your sake alone. Um, so first, first though, let's have a look and see uh, text ninety one and see what Vivian Amitraya has to say about it. So again, text ninety one. The meaning is, what is what is the thought in the jiva before the meaning of namaha takes root in the mind. So before we understood this idea of uh, all these ideas that were there in the word Namaha, the Lord, who is completely independent, stands as his own meaning for his own purpose. The achit, right, meaning material nature, the material elements, right, the unconscious material elements, which is completely dependent, stands for others, right, has to, is for the purpose of others. Previously, the soul thinks that because it has knowledge, it stands as its own meaning, it stands for its own purpose sometimes. And because it has sheshatva or, or servitorship, it stands for others at, other, at sometimes. So previously, before understanding the, the real purport of the word namaha or namo, we think that we are for our own, we've got our own purposes sometimes, and we can, other times we can, we can uh, serve the servant, uh, purposes of others. But through the word namaha, it becomes like achit. It becomes like insentient matter. That is, the soul becomes like insentient matter. And as told by the alwar, it stands only for him. It, 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 it stands only for God. It is for God's purpose only. The thought that the soul would have prior to and after understanding of namaha is shown here. So there are three tattvas or principles. They are chit and achit and ishra. Chit means the individual soul, consciousness. Achit, unconscious matter, right? And ishra, God, who is also conscious, right? But he's the supreme consciousness. Ishra is self-dependent or independent. And as such, he stands for himself. He has, he has his own purposes and he stands completely for himself. Achit has no consciousness. The, in, the insentient matter has no consciousness and as such cannot be for itself and is there for others only. Prior to the understanding of the word namo, because the chaitana or the individual soul 
has sheshatvam, or it has this uh, nature of being a servant, right? Uh, as said in the suppressed fourth case, in the suppressed fourth case, right? Uh, and knowledge or knowledge as said in mamaka, mamakaram, in makaram, sorry, knowledge as in makaram, the letter M, the letter M uh, in omkar, which represents the soul. He thinks that he stands in common between being for himself and being for others. So he, he thinks that the soul initially thinks that, thinks that he's uh, sometimes for his own purpose and acts sometimes for the purpose of others. Once the meanings of Namaha are fully soaked into the mind, just as the, the Achit has no consciousness, stands only for others, so too the soul realizes that he stands only for God. He stands only for the Lord. He stands only for him. Right? He is for the purpose of God only. He is the, the, like the property of the Lord or the slave of the Lord. This is what is told by uh, the Alwar, right? where he says that the soul should be distributed, should be distributed only for him. Therefore, this is the thought that fructifies from the understanding of the word Namaha. So continuing back to the text, text 92. This, uh, this means that in, in, in the state of enjoyment, when the Lord obliterates the soul's subservience, uh, not destroying his pleasure by thinking one has to guard one's subservience. This means in the state of enjoyment, right? When the Lord obliterates the soul's subservience, not destroying his pleasure by thinking one has to guard one's subservience. So uh, the, the footnote says that this particular sutra is very cryptic and is in fact intel unintelligible without the commentary. So let's have a look at the commentary. The Lord, the enjoyer of Bokta, the word bogya means enjoyment, right? Bokta means the person who enjoys the boga, or the, bo the that which is to be enjoyed, right? So bokta, uh, in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, boktaram yagyatapasam. I am the enjoyer of all sacrifices and penance. Boktaram yagyatapasam, right? Sarva loka maheshwaram suridam sarva bhutanam yapamam shanti mitati. That if you understand this, you'll that's you'll really get peace because uh, you have to understand those three things: that he, he is the uh, owner and controller of everything, he is the he is the enjoyer of everything, and that he's also your your dear well wisher. Those three things. So anyway, the Lord is the enjoyer, Bokta, uh, may come and mingle closely with the soul. As if, as if only accepting service, as Namawa described, right? And Namawa is described um, in Tiruvai Moli 967, he describes, as if he was accepting my service, he entered and consumed me, right? So sometimes the Lord, uh, the Lord is entering and, and consuming the, the soul like that. In that state, the Lord may, out of his own infatuation, Stoop to have intercourse with the soul, harimari, completely obliterating the soul's subservient position. Right. So sometimes in the service of the, of the Lord, uh, the Lord gets so wrapped up in the service of the soul that the soul seems to be um, the soul doesn't seem to be uh, a servant anymore. Right. The soul seems to be even like on an equal level to the Lord. Right. When this happens, being used for his delight alone means not destroying the Lord's enjoyment by feeling lowly and withdrawing, saying, I must guard my subservience. Right. So at that time, if the Lord wants to elevate the soul in some relationship, when, when the Lord is having some relationship with the soul, then the soul shouldn't resist that. The, the whole point of the whole point of subservience is not resisting the will of the Lord. So, if it's such a sun culprit, if the Lord has His divine purpose to make the soul uh, relate to Him in a certain way, then one has to do that. 
for the pleasure of the Lord. And let's have a look at uh, Tiruvai Moli 967, which is quoted here. Worshipping my Krishna at Tirukatkarai, my lovesickness grow. I think and then weep. He came and took me lovingly into his service. But my soul diminishes day by day, alas. All right, so let's go back to commentary here. Well, let's see what PB and Andrew says actually. We'll go back to the commentary and we'll see what PB and Andrew says about this verse 92. So again, the meaning of the text uh, of Sutra 92, what does it mean that the soul should be distributed only to him during the time that he mixes with the soul and enjoys it? He destroys the soul, Sheshatvam. So there are different relationships that, that the individual soul has with the Supreme Soul. Uh, and in those relationships, and these are, these are also called rasas or different uh, bhavas or feelings that, that, that the, the Lord wants to enjoy with the soul, like that. So sometimes when the Lord's enjoying a particular rasa with the soul, or a particular rasa with the soul, he's destroying the soul, Sheshatva, in order to do that. He's making the soul, he's elevating the soul in the sense of, in that, in that relationship, to be more like an equal. Or even to be greater than the Lord. In the case of, like, for instance, where the soul might be um, acting as the, as the father or mother of the Lord, right? In different leelas in this world, right? Or the lover of the Lord. Um, sometimes the, sometimes the, the, the soul may be, may be put in the position of chastising the Lord or of doing something, of acting in a, in a superior way. Even if we look at the Alwars, uh, we see how Peri Alwar, in his Tirupalanda, was blessing the Lord. He was blessing the Lord. Usually, only a person who's superior blesses somebody who's inferior, right? The elders of the family, they bless, bless the youngsters. You don't find the youngsters coming up and blessing the elders. You don't find a servant blessing the master. The master blesses the servant, blesses the slave, like that. So, but in, in Tirupalanda, uh, Peri Elwar is blessing the Lord. Please, you live a thousand years. He's giving a blessing to the Lord. So he has this this idea. So how can we say that he is thinking that he's a servant of the Lord? Well, actually, he is thinking that he's a servant of the Lord. But the way the Lord wants to relate to him is the Lord is elevating him to a position where uh, it seems like he is, he is, uh, he's acting in a way which is contrary to Sheshatva, his essential nature, which is the service of the Lord. So what he's saying here is, what does it mean that the soul shall be distributed only to him? During the time when he mixes with the soul, in other words, engages in a relationship with the soul and enjoys it, he enjoys that relationship. If he destroys the soul, Sheshatvam, if he appears, of course, the, the, the eternal, the servitorship of the soul is eternal. But if, if in that relationship it appears to be um, negated by the Lord, right? If the Lord places him in a position greater, like a, a parent or a, a lover or a or, or a person like uh, Peri Alwar who's blessing him, the soul should not practice Naitchana Sandhana. Naitchana Sandhana or Naitchyam means uh, humility. Humility. So in that, in that sense, right, if the Lord wants you to be like a parent, if he wants you to chastise him, if he wants that sort of thing like that, you should not show false humility at that time. Right? We should always be humble. Let's get that straight. But in a in a in this in these sort of uh, very uh, deep relationships with the Lord, sometimes if the Lord wants, if his if his such a sun cup, if his divine will is for you to act in a certain way, then you have to act in that way, right? If the Lord, if the master says to the slave, you have to act in that way, you, then you have to act in that way, right? And not be artificially humble. So, right, and consider it, uh, and consider that it should save its swarupa and thereby destroy his pleasure, right? So if the Lord is feeling pleasure out of, out of uh, relating to the soul in a certain way, 
then it's not up to the soul again. It's not up to the soul to say, no, I'm only the slave or I'm not, I'm only your servant. I can't relate to you as a lover or as a parent. Right? But it has to be his will. It's not the will of the soul to act like that. It's not the will of the slave to act like the master. But if the master says you have to act like that, then he has to act like that. And thereby destroy his, his pleasure. If we artificially insist that we are, that we are that, that on practicing humility and uh, showing our sheshat from our servitorship, right? When he wants to engage in a relationship of an equal or of a, uh, where the soul is in a greater position, right? That will destroy his pleasure. That is, the soul should accept every act of his. What's the ultimate bottom line? The bottom line is whatever he says, what, however he wants to, however the, however, the, however the Lord wants to relate to the soul, that the soul has to accept. Has to accept that. In the previous sutra, it, is, it was said, uh, so it was said something about this, and now this is being explained. When Sriman Narayana steps down from his greatness, right, his supreme greatness, and mixes with the jiva, right, and begins to enjoy it, some rasa, some, some relationship, he might destroy the jiva's sheshatvam. It appears, it appears that the, the, the servitorship of the, of the jiva is being sometimes uh, changed. Right? But of course, it's eternal, so it's never changed. At that time, the jiva should not think that it should protect its sheshat from its servitorship and perform naicham or humility and destroy his pleasure. Being distributed to him means being like periyalwa, being like periyalwa. And I mentioned about periyalwa, giving that, giving the blessings to the Lord and accepting everything that he does or everything that he wants, that the Lord wants. So going back to the, uh, going back to, to Sutra number 93 in the main text, right? So after that explanation, what is the reason why the soul would destroy the Lord's pleasure in this way, right? So this, this idea of being, of, showing this artificial humility when the Lord doesn't want you to show that humility. To, his, to this he says, the reason for destroying, as stated before and will be stated again later, the reason for destroying, right, the Lord's pleasure in this way, has been stated before and will be stated again. The reason why the soul would destroy the Lord's pleasure by, by feeling lowly and withdrawing when the Lord seizes him and makes use of him has been stated before in the pranava by declaring that subservience alone is the soul's essential nature right subservience alone is that soul's essential nature right from the letter u exclusivity exclusive uh, servitorship to the supreme lord his subservience to the supreme lord alone is there given in the pranava since the fourth case ending on the word Narayana in the Asakshara Mantra, the word Narayana has got Aya on the end. That's the fourth case ending, meaning two or four Narayana. Right? Refers to the soul as one whose nature is to serve. The soul's nature is to serve. Right? If the soul is a servant, he has to serve somebody, and that has to be Sriman Narayana. Kinkara Swabhavan. Kinkara means a servant. Kinkara Swabhava. His Swabhava, his essential nature is, his essential nature is to be a servant. Right? It also will be stated in the following word. It also will be stated in the following word. After this, so after this, he reveals by various ways, the distinctive excellence of affirming his dependence. Okay, so let's have a look and see what Hibya Nangacharya says about Sutra 93. Again, Sutra 93. The meaning is, 
what is the reason for the soul to perform nachiya or humility and to destroy the, the Supreme Lord's joy when he mixes with the soul? What would be the reason for that? That cause is the same that is explained in the pranava, in the omkara, which is that the nature of the soul is sheshatram, right? So if you think that, if you, if you think very deeply that you are the servant of the Lord and you have that humility of being the slave of the Lord, right? Then you have the, the tendency would be there by, think, by overthinking that to destroy the, the, um, the pleasure of the Lord in certain, in certain instances where he mixes with the soul. This, um, this uh, and has some relationship with the soul. This, this was shown before and is also shown in the open fourth case that follows. So previously it was told that the soul should not destroy his joy when he mixes with it and enjoys it. So something should be prevented only if there is a chance for it to happen. Something should be prevented only if there is a chance for it to happen. So is there a chance for the soul to do that? Is there a chance for the soul to be more than what it is, to be more than just a servant? No, there is no chance of that. There is no chance of that. The soul is and always will be a servant of the Lord. That is the essential nature of the soul. So the point being made here is he's given a saying. Uh, he's giving a logic here, which full of Nyaya. And it says, uh, Prashaktasya, Prashaktasyaiva, he Pratishdeda, Pratishdeda, right? That something should be prevented only if it has a chance of happening. There's no, there's no, we should make a rule. We have to make a rule only if we think that something may happen. If we, if we think that there, there may be somebody who break the rule, then we make a rule. If we think that the soul could become the master, could really actually become the master, then we have to make a, then we have to be careful of that. But since the soul's essential nature is servitorship, there's no need for us to, to make a rule that the soul cannot be told by God or be uh, God mixing with the soul or having some relationship with the soul cannot involve God uh, being putting the soul in, a, in, the, in the position of a father or a mother or a, uh, a person to give blessings like Peri Alwar or a lover uh, in a superior position to the Lord, right? So therefore, because there's no reality in that, it's, it's, a, it's a rasa, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a play, right? right? It's for the Lord's pleasure that he, he would do that, right? And therefore, because it's, there is no chance for it to happen, Therefore, we don't actually have to, to stop it by, get, by being falsely humble and not, in, not allowing the Lord to enjoy the soul in that way. Does that make sense? So it is possible because the reason, it is possible because the reason for the removal of his joy is the same sheshatvam. So we may think, that uh, the reason for the, the removal of, of, the, of the Lord's joy is the thinking of the thinking by the soul that it is the servant of God, right? That is said in the pranavam as the nature of the soul. This, this will be shown in the explicit fourth case, ayah that follows. The explicit fourth case that follows, narayanaya. When we have the word narayana, at the end it has ayah, the end of the astakshara mantra, the last. Aya, in the last two syllables, right? Which uh, which come on the Rhino. Okay, so going back to the um, the text. So after this, he reveals by various ways the distinctive excellence of affirming this dependence, the excellence of of affirming this dependence or paratamtra. The soul is always dependent. So what's the, how, where's the excellence of affirming this dependence? Text 94, when this realization arises, one has done what one ought to do. 
when this thought is absent, all evil deeds have been done. Right? So when one has the realization of Sheshatva, right? Of Paratantra, of complete dependence and subservience to the Lord, <clears throat> then one has done what he ought to do. So one has to, if one has that realization, that's fine, right? When the thought is absent, then all evil de deeds have, be have been done. When we don't have this, this idea of being subservient and, and completely, completely um, dependent on the Lord, then it leads to all sorts of evil deeds. In this realization, all good deeds are present in the realization of Paratantra, of Sheshatva of subservience and dependence. Without this, whatever sacrifices or atoning rites, yagyas and prayas etc., one has done are useless. So one has to have this mentality, has to have this realization. Without this realization, with, with this realization, having this realization, all sins depart and all rewards come about. When this realization arises, one has done what one ought to do. This means that when this conviction of one's extreme dependence on the Lord, paratantra pratipati, arises, such as one, uh, one says, please take me for oneself alone. Please take me for oneself alone. Right? And this is, a, this is from Tiruvai uh, 294 which we um, quoted before, right? Um, then one has successfully accomplished all that needs to be done to facilitate one's salvation. Ita. Ita means also upaya, right? It's like means the means. Uh, tattva hita and purusharta. Purusharta is the goal. Tattva is the realization, right? The swarupa and Rupaya or Hita is the means, the Lord. One has done everything that he needs to know. Once he has that realization, that is, that is it. That realization itself is, uh, facilitates that. When this thought is absent, all evil deeds have, have been done. This means, when he says this in the Sutra, this means that when this conviction of dependence is not present, when you do not have this paratantra realization that you're completely dependent on the Lord, just like the Lord's possession, in a, like an insentient object belonging to the Lord, a complete slave of the Lord. As it is said, what sin has he not committed? The thief who steals the soul by considering it his own. Right? All, uh, all evil deeds will certainly have been done by him. So on the, on the contrary, when you do not have this realization of paratantria, of sheshatra, servitorship, and paratantria, of complete dependence on the Lord, then everything you do is a sin, basically, if you don't have that realization. This is interesting because in the northern school or the Wadagalite, um, Sri Vaishnava school. There's an understanding that one can do bhakti yoga and also do, or or do property if one is not um, qualified to do bhakti yoga. And there are other yogas that, that people can also do. They're also given in the shastras that the Lord says you can do these other yogas, kama yoga, jnana yoga, and they all all involve some form, some small uh, some small form of ahankara. So they're all just a little bit not the full realization or the pure realization of being completely subservient to the will of the Lord, like a piece of property, unconscious property. So what he's saying here is that even if, if, that, if that realization, that pure realization of complete and utter dependence on a country and subservience, Sheshatva to the Lord, if that isn't completely understood, then, then, everything will be, all those things will be evil. So, so the, the idea of the Tengala Sri Vaishnava Acharyas, the Southern school of the Sri Vaishnava system, right? The idea is that even that, uh, that 
performance of Karma Yoga, Jnana Yoga, or even Bhakti Yoga acts with a, with a hint of ahankara, that I'm doing that act, that I'm performing that act, that I'm trying in some way to bring about my own salvation in some small way, even if it's a cooperative way where the Lord, you know, is, is cooperating by giving his grace, but I have to do something, right, that, that works are important and faith alone is not, is, is not the grace, it is not going to save us, right? Then that is tinged with a slight amount of, of, of egoness and possessiveness, and therefore, Therefore, that is considered actually an evil act by the Tengalaya Acharyas. They don't consider these other, these other forms given in the scriptures to be the proper, the proper way, the proper method, right? To, to, the proper method to attain. And, they're, and they're, therefore, he's talking against this. He's saying that this, uh, you know, in the absence of this pure understanding, of Sheshatra, of servitorship, and of Paratantra, complete dependence on the Lord and no other, not even oneself for, for any degree of saving oneself, right? Then, then only by that way, that is, the, that is the method, right? Then the Lord alone becomes the, the means and not anything that I do myself or think myself, right? And therefore, therefore, if there is that tinge of ahankara there, of mamakara there, that in those activities, even if it's bhakti yoga, like that, it's considered to be wrong. It's just considered to be to be to be tinged and not pure. <clears throat> of course, we can't really say we can't really say that these other paths which are taught by the Lord are incorrect. There are people who have the mentality to follow those paths, and therefore let them follow those paths like that until you come to the realization that uh, those paths also have to be given up, right? At the end of Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna says, Sarvadam Ampritita, all these paths have to be given up, actually. After having renounced all these paths that I just told you about, Arjuna, right? And just surrender unto me, then I'll save you from, from all fear and you'll get liberation like that. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, in this realization, in the realization, what realization are we talking about? We're talking about the realization of Paratantriya, of absolute dependence on the Lord. All good deeds are present, right? So there's no need actually to do any good deeds. There's no need to do any good deeds at all, right? It's the realization, the realization which brings about the result, the realization of one's true nature as being just like the property of the Lord and being completely dependent and subservient to the Lord, that brings about the result, right? All the good deeds are present within that realization. So it's very, it's very similar actually to the, the system of the Advaitins. The Advaitins like Adi Shankar Acharya, they have this system, Gyanat Moksha. They say Gyanat Moksha. Gyanat, uh, it's the ablative case of Gyana, knowledge. It means from knowledge, from knowledge, Moksha. Liberation comes from knowledge. So the point being made here is from that realization, all good de deeds uh, are present. And Shankara would say a similar thing. He would say that we have to give up all the works, give up the works, give up karma yoga, and only do jnana yoga. Right? So in a similar way, although the jnana or the knowledge is, is different because the knowledge, the knowledge that Shankara is trying to get people to understand is the, is, is the knowledge that that we are the same as God, that we are God. So that's incorrect knowledge. That's not, not proper knowledge. It's not true knowledge, right? That is half truth. And half truth is worse than a lie, right? When you go to court, you swear, I tell, I'll tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, right? So you can't just say, I'll tell the truth, but I'm not going to tell all the truth. I'm just going to, I'm going to hold back some statements. Right, which make all the difference in the court case, right? So you have to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, right? So you have to you have to tell the truth, right? You have to tell all of the truth. You can't leave any parts out, right? And you have to uh, and you have to not add anything. Don't add anything of your own to it that is perhaps not truth, right? So it has to be truth. It has to be all of all the facts, all the truth, 
and, and, and you can't add anything to it. Nothing subtracted and nothing added the truth. So the problem with Shankara's philosophy is Shankara has told some truth. There's a little bit of truth there. He's saying that the, the soul is spiritual and God is spiritual. The soul has consciousness and God has consciousness. The problem, he says, is that the soul is equal to God. The soul is not equal to God. That's wrong. So he has said something which is not true. He's equated the soul. So he said some truth that the soul is like a spark and the God is like a fire. You know, the soul is very, the God is very great. The soul is very small. That's the Vaishnava system. We understand that the proper relationship between the Atman, the individual soul, and the Paramatma, the supreme soul. That's the proper realization. Shankara has misunderstood that. Yes, we're spiritual. Yes, God is also spiritual. Yes, even this material world is spiritual because everything comes from God. Everything is a part of God. He is. The, the material world and the souls are like the body of God, right? The, shesh, the sharira shariri bhava of Ramanuja, the idea of the analogy of the body and the soul, perfectly explains the relationship between the soul, the souls and matter and God. And Shankara has not explained that. And other philosophers, they're not explaining that in a proper way, right? So they're telling some truth. So we can tell some truth, but if we're not... Just like the Vodagalai Sri Vaishnavas, they're saying, yes, bhakti by bhakti yoga, by kama yoga, by jnana yoga. These other processes are taught in the scriptures by the Lord. So therefore we can follow them. We should follow them. If we're, if we're qualified to follow them, we should follow them. The question by the Tengalais is, are you qualified to follow them? Is a piece of insentient matter qualified to do anything on its own? Is a piece of insentient matter or a slave qualified to do anything on his own? No, he is not. If he is totally subservient and totally dependent upon the master, like a piece of insentient matter, then he's not qualified to do anything on his own. So the premise of the Wadagalize is wrong. The premise of the Wadagalize is you are qualified to do bhakti yoga. You are qualified to do karma yoga. You're qualified to do jnana yoga. Therefore, you can do it. There you therefore, you should do it because it's stated in the, in the Shastra. The Lord says, do it. He's commanded you to do it in the Shastra. No, no. We say no. He hasn't commanded us to do it. He's commanded us to do it if we're qualified to do it. But we're not qualified to do it. Why are we not qualified to do it? We're not qualified because we are so dependent upon the Lord. Like a piece of insentient matter. Like the Lord's possession or like his slave. We're totally dependent upon him. Therefore, we're not. It's that we don't have the qualification of, of independent action. So therefore, if we say, do this, do this, do this, do this. No, we can't do that because we can't do something which is against our essential nature. And our essential nature is to be totally, absolutely subservient and dependent upon the Lord. That's the point of the Tengal Ashri Vaishnavas. So. As with Shankara, as with, uh, as with uh, the Wadagalais, whatever it is, they are telling some of the truth, but the full truth has to be only understood like this. In that realization, all good, all good deeds will be present. So in the proper realization, the proper realization of the true nature of the soul, the true nature of the, the, true nature of the means, the Lord, which is the Lord, and the true nature of the, of the fruit, right? And these are also described uh, in other places as, as artapanchikam, the five things, right? But, but basically they are tattvahita and purusharta, the, the reality of the soul, and, uh, of reality, and uh, the hita, the upaya, the means to liberation, and the goal. The means and the goal are the same. They're the Lord. And the, 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 so what we really need to understand most perfectly is the realization of our situation, of what our actual uh, swarupa is, what our actual um, uh, essential nature is, what our actual essential nature is. And everything will come from that. All good deeds will come from that. Why? Because he himself is the, is the means. We're not the means. So he will, he will do everything. This means that when this is present, when this realization is present, the pleasure which would arise to the Lord if one 
had done all good deeds will flourish. Understand? So if we have that realization, it's as good as if we did those things. So we have other people saying, maybe, maybe, uh, uh, maybe people say you have to chant this, you have to bow down, you have to do this worship, you have to do these different things, you have to study, you have to do, you have to work, and you have to give up the fruits of that work. You have to do all those things. No. If you realize this, your complete dependence on the Lord, if you realize this, if you really realize this, all good deeds will be present. It will be just, it, it will please him just as much as those people who do all those things. So he has some people who think that they can do things. They think they can perform some sadhanas. They think they can, they can follow uh, karma yoga. They can work and give up the result. They can do jnana yoga. They can study the shastras and they can, they can, they can attain some realization like that by their efforts. And, and all these other paths of effort, even the path of bhakti yoga, where they can do the shravanam, the kirtanam, the bhakti smaranam, all these different things. Vishwasmaranam, right? They can do all these things, right? And they can offer these things to the Lord. They can do them as a service to the Lord. They can do them uh, in, order to, in order to gain, uh, in order to gain liberation. Right? as a means to liberation, even if that liberation comes by some sort of mercy as well, some cooperative grace, right? But as long as they're thinking that, as long as they're thinking that they have, a, uh, they have a part in doing that, that they are the doer, if they concentrate on that, that idea that they are the doer, uh, at least of anything, of something like that, that is, not, that is not the whole truth. That is not the pure, nothing but the truth. They have, they have added something there, right? But if they think simply, if they think, think simply the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, that they are completely subservient and dependent on the Lord, then this means, this realization, right, that when that realization is, pre pleasant, is present in the mind of the, in the individual, the pleasure which would arise to the Lord if one had done all those things, had done all that karma yoga, jnana yoga, and bhakti yoga, right, will flourish. So it's as if he did all those things. He didn't do all those things, but if he, if he had done all those things, it's just, therefore, in, in this affirmation of one's dependence on the Lord, all good deeds are present. Without this, whatever sacrifices or atoning rites that one has done is useless. Without this mentality, this means that when this conviction of dependence is lacking all sacrifices, etc., that, that the chaitanya, the individual soul, has done in order to please the Lord, as well as all the atoning rites, such as kritcha and chandrayana. Kritcha is a type of fast that you have to do for as prize to you if you perform some sin. Chandrayana means fasting according to the, 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 uh, the fortnight of the moon, right? By taking less or more handfuls of, of, of food every day, right? Uh, which he has done in order to destroy his sins, that is prize chitta. All these sacrifices that one does, either positive or, or, or to atone for negative sins, right? Will facilitate either the Lord's pleasure or removal of his own sins. Therefore, they are useless. They are useless if you don't have this right uh, understanding. If that conviction of dependence is lacking, if that this conviction of dependence is lacking, now it's it's not completely lacking with the with the what is the Northern School of Sri Vaishnava. It's not completely lacking. They admittedly there are many groups. There are many people who believe that yes, I do something in the grace of God. Uh, if I if I move one step, then he'll move a hundred steps towards me, right? My my small effort is necessary though for him to make a great effort and save me. But this is this is not the whole truth. This is not nothing but the truth. They have added something there. There is no, there is not there there is not the the purity of uh, of uh, there is not the purity of uh, realization there. The purity of the realization means the conviction of total dependence is lacking in that idea. The Tengalashi Vaishnavas want to, want to insist upon the, the conviction 
of total dependence. When you have that conviction of total dependence, then there's no, there's no need to do anything. That is property. That is surrender. That is that, that conviction of total dependence with totally being dependent on the Lord, that realization. The question is, now Vedanta Deshika, in, in all his greatness, what he says is, he says, even that conviction, that conviction is an act. That conviction is an act. Lord Rama says, just say my that I'm yours, right? So you actually have to say it. That's an act. That's an effort, right? Even that is a small effort. You have to make that small effort. So you can't say that you're not making any effort. No. The Tengalaya Acharyas say, no, that is not an effort. That's just a realization. If I just have the realization that I'm completely dependent and subservient to God, that's not an effort. That's not a separate effort. Right? If the slave or the possession just, just understands his true nature as a slave or the possession of a master, that's not an effort on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the part of the slave. If the slave just says, oh, you're my master, there's no effort involved in that. That's just a realization of the nature of, of, of the fact, right? of the true nature of the soul. Right. So what he's saying here is that, that, uh, that, that when this conviction of dependence, of total dependence is lacking, then, then it, everything else is useless. So all of these things, karma yoga, jnana yoga, bhakti yoga, they're all useless if that realization of total dependence is lacking. And the realization is to of total dependence is lacking if one thinks that in any way, shape, or form, he is the one who is doing those things. And that is why that even the Bodhagalais, they go through this system of doing the sattvika tyaga before they do any act any ritual act they say i'm not doing this god is doing this through me even ramanu just says to do this in the in his uh, uh nitya nitya granta right in his in his book the nitya which is about the daily activities of a vaishnava or a follower of ramanuja it's there this sattvika tyaga being giving up giving up the agency giving up the agency totally giving up the agency and the result of a particular act, right? By, by, by firmly stating it out loud uh, in the beginning and the end of every act that this is not being done by me, this is being done by the Lord for his own purpose, for his own pleasure, right? And therefore it, it is his, he alone who, who gets the fruit for, of it. With this realization, Again, with this realization, what is the realization of total dependence? Total dependence means uh, paratantra, paratantra, total dependence on the Lord. With this realization, all sins depart and all rewards come about. Because of the conviction of one's dependence on him, the Lord will show abundant favor, anugraha. Anugraha means his blessings, his, his grace, his favor uh, to him. Thereby, all sins which exist in the form of the Lord's disfavor, right? All the opposite, the opposite. What, is he, what does Lord Krishna say in Bhagavad Gita? He says, Ham twa sarva pape bio. Sarva from all sin. Sarva pape bio. From all sin. Right? I will save you from all sin. From all sin means from all acts which are displeasing to me because you think that you're separate, that you have some separate will than me, that you, that you are a doer, that you're, not, that you're something other than my completely dependent slave or property, right? If you do anything, good or bad, if, if it's stated in the scriptures to be good or bad, but if you do it thinking that you are separate from me, that you are, that you are, that you are not my property and my total slave, right? With that mentality, that will be a sin. Whether it's considered in the scriptures to be punyo papa, whether it's considered to be a, 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 you know, a, 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 a spiritual thing or a, or, a, or a sinful thing, a good thing or a bad thing, right? Still, if it involves that ego, if it involves that wrong realization that you're not totally, absolutely dependent upon the Lord, then that is a sin. That's why the Tengalai Sri Vaishnavacharyas say that even these paths of effort, these other paths of individual effort, karma yoga, jnana yoga, and even bhakti yoga, right? These involve, these are slightly sinful. 
is considered to be slightly sinful. Thereby, all sins that exist in the form of the Lord's disfavor, nigrahat makamana, sa kala kala papa kalam kalum, will depart, <clears throat> as it is said. As it is said in uh, Periya Tirubandadi fifty-three. Right. Thus, the Lord will try. Uh, sorry. As it is said, you are constantly saying, what can I do for the devotees? You're constantly saying, what can I do for the devotees? Thus, the Lord will try over and over again to do something to help the soul. Thereby, all rewards will come about from the cessation of samsara, from the cessation of samsara, meaning going to moksha, to the attainment of service, which means the, the, the moksha, means the kainkari, the eternal service in Vaikuntha. Thus he has revealed the meaning of the middle word. The meaning of the middle word, what's the middle word? Om is the first word, Narayana is the second, last word. The middle word is Namaha. Thus he has explained the full meaning of the middle word. And after this, we'll go to the meaning of the word Narayanaya. Right? So let's see what Pibi Anangacharya says about this 94th verse, which is the end of discussing about the word Namaha. So in text 94, again, he says, as soon as the knowledge of dependence on the Lord is born, a soul has completed all that he has to do for his benefit. Let me say that again. As soon as this knowledge of complete and utter dependence on the Lord comes into your mind. As soon as you understand that, right? Then you have understand the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And at that time, a soul has completed all that he has to do for his own benefit. That's all he has to do to reach moksha. Without this knowledge, it becomes as if that as if he has committed all sins. Doesn't matter what you do. So maybe you're following the scriptures, maybe you're doing sacrifices, maybe you're doing karma yoga, jnana yoga, bhakti yoga. But without this complete this knowledge of complete and utter subservience of paratantra, it is considered like a sin. If this knowledge is present, however, of complete and utter subservience to the Lord, like a piece of property or a slave with no will of his own, it becomes as that he has done all things that cause the Supreme Lord joy. God will be completely ecstatic about this. He will, he will have complete bliss about this because he understands that his, his servants, his slaves, his property understands their true nature. When they understand their true nature, then liberation is attained. Any yagas or prayas chittas, any good sacrifices or sacrifices to get rid of the bad reactions of sins, right? Which is what Arjuna was worried about. At the end of the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna was worried. What about all the sins that I committed in so many lifetimes? I have mountains of sins. I've committed every sin that's possible to commit. I've committed it because I've lived unlimited life, lifetimes in, in, in unlimited different forms of, of life, in different bodies. So I must have committed so many sins. Right? So how do I possibly get rid of this? By prize to by atoning. How can I atone for those things? Any, any positive yagyas that somebody does, any positive actions that somebody does according to the scriptures, or any actions that he does to alleviate the, 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 the karmas coming from those sins, the reactions coming from those sinful activities, right? Without, without having that realization of being totally dependent and subservient to the Lord, right? Is, is a waste, is a total waste. It's a total waste. All sins are removed just by this knowledge, by this realization of total subservience to the Lord, Paratantra, and all gains from getting out of the birth cycle, out of the, birth, the cycle of birth and death, to doing eternal service to the Lord in, in his abode are obtained. So everything bad is gotten rid of, and everything good is attained. 
right? Simply by this knowledge, by this understanding of Paratantra. T.B. Anangacharya says, the good effects that happen to the knowledge, the good effects that happen by the knowledge of being dependent on no one but the Lord are now explained. If a person is to be considered as one who has complete, completed everything that is required for his benefit, then he should get the knowledge of being enslaved only to him, the Supreme Lord. As the Alwar said in his, in his Pasaram, right? If he gets the, that knowledge, then he would become one who has done what he needs to do just by getting that knowledge. If not, then he becomes that, it becomes that he has committed all sins. So it's either black or white, it's black or white. If you have this knowledge, if you have this, if, if you understand this, this truth, the whole truth and nothing but this truth, right, then you've attained the goal. If you do not understand it even a little bit, if, there, if you've mixed with some untruth, if, if you didn't understand the whole truth, right, then somehow or other it's considered like you've committed all sins. This can be understood from the other uh, example that's given here in the other pastor. It, it is it, in this knowledge, all good things are present. That is the same joy that, that the Supreme Lord gets when the soul does all good things is obtained when this knowledge is gained. All activities such as yagas and penances that are done without this knowledge gain neither his joy, the Supreme Lord's joy, nor do they remove one's sins and therefore are wasted. So you may think that you are attaining something by doing the worship of the Lord. You may think that you're attaining, that you're getting rid of your sin by performing some prayers to that, but in actual fact, because you're not pleasing the Supreme Lord, it's a complete waste of time. Because of this, if you do it without this knowledge of Paratantra, because of this knowledge, he showers his grace on that soul and therefore all sins, all the sins that hold him down are destroyed. This is why he says to Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita, Sarva Dharma Parityaja, give up all these paths of effort, Karma Yoga, Jnana Yoga, Bhakti Yoga that I just taught you in the last 700 slokas. I just taught you about Karma Yoga, Jnana Yoga and Bhakti Yoga. Definitely give up sinful actions. Give up sinful actions too, right? But give up even these pious actions. Sarva Dharma Paritija, surrender to me completely and give up all these, these, these act actions, give up all these yogas, these paths of effort, of self-effort, right? Of independent effort by you, right? Right? Sarva Dharma Paritija, Mami Kam Sharanam Paja, and just surrender unto me. What does that surrender unto me mean? Right? That surrender unto me means having this realization, having this knowledge that you're completely dependent upon me. You are completely dependent upon me like an insentient piece of matter, like a, like, a, like a slave, like a total slave, totally dependent upon me, complete paratantra, like that. If you do that, sarva pape bio, moksha yishami masa you will be freed from all your sins, sarva papa, and moksha yishami, you will attain liberation. Don't fear, he says, Master Jaha. Don't, don't doubt it, right? Fear means what? You shouldn't fear that this is wrong, that his statement is wrong, that, that somehow or other it's not true, that somehow or other the sins will still be there or you won't attain liberation, that somehow or other you are not surrendered to him, that you are not his property, that you are not his, 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 his complete slave. You shouldn't fear these things. You shouldn't doubt these things. There should be no doubt. Have total absolute conviction in this. And if you have total absolute conviction in this, it'll work. That's what property is. That's, that's what property is. That is the Tenacharya Sampradaya's understanding of the Charma Sloka. The realization has to be there. That's all. And that realization is complete and utter dependence and subservience to the Lord. And through that, everything is gained. All sins are destroyed. All the reactions to sins are destroyed. And liberation is, is gained. But don't fear. One has to have total conviction in it. If you doubt it, don't doubt it, is what Krishna is saying. Don't doubt it. Right? Don't doubt. Right? So, um, Let's go back. Let's, there's a uh, 
So then he says, because this nature, because this nature, he showers his grace on that soul, and therefore all sins that hold him down are destroyed. And he gains such benefits as the escape from the samsaric cycle, right? Getting out of the samsaric cycle, right? Moksha Yashami, and eternal service to the Lord, also Moksha Yashami. That, that he attains this, this, the, the eternal service of the Lord in Sri Vaikuntha. Thus far, the meanings of the Namaha part of the Tira Mantra have been explained. So this is the end of that part. So then we have a question here. Uh, he said, but the main underlying source of all sin is thinking that one has some independence. And thus, just at the moment one realizes this, the true root of all sin is destroyed. This is so profound. Thus, why property is momentary. Correct. So what, is, what does Lord Rama say? He says, Sakrideva, once only. Sakrideva prapannaya. Once you come to a realization, you can never go back. Right? But Lord Krishna says to Arjuna, don't doubt it. He says, Masuchaha, don't doubt it. Sometimes people, they may understand about property. They may seemingly understand it like that. And then somebody else comes along and says them, says them something, something else and they get doubts. They get a doubt. Well, Krishna says, don't doubt it. Don't doubt it. Understand it. Understand the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. You are completely dependent and subservient on God. If you understand that, everything bad is destroyed. Everything good is created. Right? You, would, you get rid of all your sins and you attain liberation. By that realization, everything is, everything will happen. Without that realization, all you're just involved in sin. Otherwise, that's basically what it's saying here. And that is all coming from an understanding of the word Namaha. And it can under, you can understand it in, in the Omkara from the letter A and the letter U also, and the letter M. It can be understood in Omkara also, but it explicitly is given by the letter Namaha, the, letter, the, 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 the word Namaha or Namo. In the word on the in the mantra on the monarayanaya, so now we come to the end of understanding about the uh, of the of the deeper meanings of namaha. The next part we're going to be discussing about narayana and how it has the 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 how it has the uh, the ending aya on it and what are the meanings of narayana and what are the meanings of aya and everything. And then, um, but but now we've come to a, a section. So because we've come to a section to an end of a section now. So I think we should leave it here. So if there are any questions or comments about what we discussed today, um, I was get, perhaps going to look at Tir, uh, Peria Tiruvandadi 1953. Uh, we, could, we could look at that, but uh, in, you know, it, was, it was explained pretty much in the, in the commentary, so. Um, really, really wonderful. Thank you very much. That was really, really wonderful. Yeah, it's 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 sort of deep, but uh, you know it has to be deep. Yeah, we have to. You have to understand it in that sense, like that. You can't. It can't be ninety nine percent. It has to be hundred percent understood. The Paratantra. Yeah, that, that I was thinking that same when you answered the question. I had that same question about since Varakalais think that they can do bhakti yoga. I was wondering if any one of them does bhakti yoga and if when they do bhakti yoga, if they do they're not doing tyaga. like I was saying, they're yeah. doing sattvika tyaga, they're doing sattvika tyaga, they're doing they're not doing bhakti yoga, they're all doing property like that. So they talk the game, they talk the game that yeah, you can do bhakti yoga, but nobody does it, nobody's doing it. Nobody said, mm -hmm. if you ask them, are you a bhakti yogi? Are you doing bhakti yogi? No, no, no. No, no. They're properness. They're all properness. Everybody's properness. Like that. So it's only theoretical. It's only theoretical. And the, and the whole idea is Vedanta Deshika is trying to emphasize the doership of the soul because that's there in, in, that's there in the Upanishads. It's, I mean, it's true that the soul, you know, can be a doer according to the, according to the Vedas, according to the Upanishads. Like that. But only... But the more important aspect, the more important, um, uh, the more important and primary um, uh, meaning of the soul is that the soul is completely subservient to the Lord, just like a just like an insentient thing or or, or a complete slave, like that. It's the paratantra which is more important. 
There's complete subservience and the complete dependence on the Lord. Like that. Look at Dropity. Dropity. Dropity was trying to save herself. She can't save herself. She's a okay. So in the in the in the assembly house, right? The the Korovers, you know, Yudhisthir gambled and he lost his kingdom and he lost everything and he even lost his wife. And because he lost his wife, the people who won her said, okay, well, let's see what we won and let's pull the, her sari off and let's see her naked. So they tried, they, you know, these big, you know, uh, strong guys are trying to, they're pulling on the lady's sari. She's, uh, she's, she can't possibly save herself. She can't, but in the beginning, she thought, yeah, let me call out to Krishna. Please, Krishna, oh, Govinda, Govinda, you know, please, you know, save me. You know, Krishna was in Dwarka, but she called out on the name of Krishna and, uh, and Krishna was going to save her. But Krishna saw that she was holding. She was trying to hold the sari. She was trying to protect herself. When the Lord sees that you're trying to protect yourself, you're trying to do something like that. He's not going to save you. He didn't save her. He did not save her while she was trying to protect herself. If you're trying to do all these things that are given in the scriptures, you're trying all these paths of effort like karma yoga, yana yoga, and bhakti yoga. If you're trying to attain liberation on your own merits, even if you if you say, even if she's thinking, oh well, I'm trying to protect myself, I hold my sorry, but Krishna will come and also he'll help. So you know there'll there'll be some cooperation. But it, this is the uh, Mar, uh, market and yaya that the monkey, the, the baby monkey, hangs on to the mother and the mother goes from tree to tree. And that way the, the monkey also goes from tree to tree. So we may think, oh, God is going to help us. God is going to give us. And so we have to do something like that. Faith and works are required for liberation. You know, it's a cooperative grace. We, we won't get the grace of the Lord unless we do something. God helps those who help themselves is what people say, right? But that's not, that's not what he's saying. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, he's saying, abandon all effort. Abandon all of these paths of effort and simply surrender unto me. What does that surrender mean? That surrender means, Lord Rama says, just say, I am yours. The realization, that realization that I am yours, that I'm your property, that I am your insentient property or I am your slave. That is liberation. That is your realization. That is not an act. That is not, that is not a thing which is, you know, which is any sort of, takes any sort of effort. It's just a realization of what you really are. The whole truth, nothing but the truth. That 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 you're completely and, and utterly subservient. So once she understood that, once Draupadi understood that, when she thought, I can't, she thought, she thought, oh, I'll just, you know, hang on to my sari and Krishna will provide the rest. You know, I'll just do bhakti yoga, and Krishna will provide the grace and, and the rest. No, give it up. She gave it up. She I can't protect myself. Once she came to that realization, I can't protect myself, she put her hands up and said, Oh, Govinda, protect me. I'm completely, you know, what did, what did the Alwar say? If, I, if you want to do this with me or if you want to do that with me, that's up to you. What did Chaitanya even say in, in Shikshastika? If you want to crush me by your embrace, you can. It's completely up to him. It's completely up to him. It's completely his, his will and wish, his Satya Sankalpa, his divine will. Right? So only when you come to that realization, that's it, finished. That's the end. Nothing more has to be done or spoken. Or so coming to that realization. Now, if somehow or other you fall into illusion again in this material world and somehow or other somebody convinces you that you, haven't, you have to go and do some other thing or you have to like that, okay, God will take that as an excuse that he surrendered to me. He, he did understand. He understood. He understood the reality. He understood that, I, that, that he is my servant, that he's my property. He understood that reality. Therefore, I'll save him. What, is, what does Vraha say in his Charma Sloka? That person was thinking of me. He was thinking the right things. He was, he was thinking that he's my servant. He's my property. He is completely dependent upon me in his life. But now he's in a coma. Now at the end of his life, or somehow or other, even... Even we can say if, 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 if Raha is going to save you at the end of your life when you're in a coma or you're like a stone or a log, right? Aham smarami madbhakta, right? So Lord, not only does Lord Rama say, Lord Krishna says, give, give up all those 
give up all those uh, paths of self-effort. Okay, so you give up those things and, and just surrender unto me. What does that surrender mean? That surrender means, as Lord Rama says, just to think that I'm your property, just to think that I'm your slave, to be, think of that you're completely dependent upon me. Right now, what happens if you forget that? If you forget that, Lord Varaha says, you've forgotten that. Okay, you forgot it. You forgot it in your life. You forgot it at the end of your life. Sometimes you knew it at one point and you forgot it. But because you knew it at one point, Ahamsmarami Badbata, I take over at that point. That point, that momentary point that Lord Rama says that you know you knew that, you understood that complete truth and whole truth and nothing but the truth. You understood that, then somehow or other you became illusioned again. And you thought, no, I have to perform these acts and I have to do this or 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 I have to do something else. No, Varaha said, no, at that point I take over. At that point, you don't have to remember me anymore. I will remember you at that point. I will remember you because you, you got to that point. All you have to do is get to that point of that realization. Lord, Lord Varaha says, I will remember you. Then it's no longer your burden to, to, to th that's what people think. They think, oh, you have to be surrendered to God. And therefore you have to be surrendered 100% 24 hours a day for the rest of your life. No. Lord Rama doesn't say that. He says momentarily. He said once only. Right? Then they still don't believe that. They still think, well, okay, you have to say it once, but you still have to think it. You still have to be there. No, because Varaha says, even if you're unconscious, even if you forget me, I remember you. I will remember you. So you have to come to that realization once only. Once, once you, and then he takes over everything. And you shouldn't have, as Krishna says, Masu Jaha, don't doubt that. Don't at all doubt that. Because that is, that is, the, that is the beauty of all the three Charma Slokas. The beauty of all the three Charma Slokas is they support each other. Lord Krishna lays it out, very simple. Abandon all varieties of religion, just surrender unto me, and you'll go to Moksha. You'll forget about the sins and just don't doubt it and go, you'll go. I'll take you to Moksha. Exactly how to do that, Lord Rama comes along and says, exactly how to do that. Just simply understand that you are my property. Just say, I am yours. Tavasmi. Tavasmi tichi achite. Abhiyam sarvabhute. I'll protect you and, and take you to moksha. Lord Vraha says, okay, once you've done that, then you might be thinking, well, I, you know, I, gave, up all, I gave up all my self-efforts. I, I, I definitely, at one point, I thought you know, that I'm completely dependent on serving the Lord. but now I lost the plot. Now I forgot about it. Now somehow or other I'm in a coma or I can't remember it or I'm mixed up in this material world. I got off the track. What's going to happen to me? Lord Raha says, Aham smarami bad bhaktam, nayami paramam gatim. I will take him to the supreme abode. I will remember him and I will take him. So, you know, they, they support each other. These charma slokas support each other. They explain each other. And, uh, and that's the problem. The problem is if you just take one, you can misunderstand it in some way like that. But if you take all three of them together, you cannot, there's no misunderstanding. It's definitely, it's definitely the whole truth and nothing but the truth. That's the problem. The problem is that there are many things in Shastras and things like that. People come up with all sorts of ideas because they take things out of context. They don't take the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Even though, even the water guys, we see that they're not, they're not looking at the, and look, looking at the whole picture. So anyway, uh, this is all coming out of the word Namaha, the Namo. So um, it's, very, it's very important to, to understand that. It'll be very interesting. We can go and we can study Rahasi Triasam and see what Vedanta Deshika says about them all. See what he says about this part and see how he says to, to, to go for it. And we'll see that it's, that, you know, if we compare it to this understanding, it'll seem like a partial understanding. It'll seem like a partial understanding like that. And, and he has his points too. He has his points about the, the doership of the soul and everything like that. But ultimately, um, I don't know if you, if you have, I mean, people have faith in that understanding. People have faith in the other understanding. I don't want to say bad things about anybody. Um, ultimately, everybody's doing the same thing, as you said, so what guys are not doing, they're not doing bhakti yoga either. They're also say they're doing property like that. They're performing property. So, 
uh, and they're doing something at Tiaga with each act and everything like that. So we, it's really not, it's really more of a, uh, of a, of an academic difference rather than a practical difference. On a practical level, everybody's doing the same thing. And it, we can say that about all the Vaishnavas too. Is it really a, is it really a difference? Even the Gaudias, even the, uh, the other Vaishnavas, they're all serving God. They're all thinking hum humbly. They're all thinking, I don't want any, anything in return. For, and he's actually the one who's doing it. You know, only by the grace of God am I able to do these things. So they're all really thinking the same things. It's just not explicitly explained in very, very clearest terms as the Tengalai Sri Vaishnavas do. The Tengalai Sri Vaishnavas explain it very, very clearly so that everybody can really understand it, right? And they say it in such a way that, that, that you can really understand it. They don't beat around the bush. They say, no, with, it, with this realization, everything's attained. Without this realization, everything is tinged with sin. Everything is a little bit wrong. It's like sweet rice with a little bit of sand in it. Like that, so it's it. There's a tinge of there of a hankara and mamakara in there, and that's what namaha is all about. It's about getting rid of completely the inus and minus, the possessiveness and the and the and the the uh, the, uh, the egoism and the possessiveness, and that's the point. Getting rid of that ego and possessiveness, and thinking, understanding that one's completely dependent and sub subservient to the Lord. That's the whole ball game. That's everything. That is everything. That's everything. And so that in that sense, it's like what Shankara said, from knowledge, from this realization, moksha, yanat moksha. So we also agree. I agree with what Shankara says, yanat moksha. It's not the same jnana as, as, as Shankara suggests. It's a different jnana. It's the jnana of being completely subservient and, and, uh, and dependent upon the Lord. With that knowledge, everything is attained. Without that knowledge, Everything is lost. Very clear. Om Tat Sat. <laughs> okay, so um, we'll pick it up next week. Yep. Jai Shri Narayanaya. Wow. Jai Shri Narayanaya. Namaskar.